Hello, podcast listener. This is Christopher. This is Matt. I'm Allison. And I'm Amanda. And you are listening to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends share the movies that chill our souls and make us want to keep still under the covers, all brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library in Michigan. Today we are talking about the movie The Bad Seed. To answer the question, Daddy, what would you give me for a basket of kisses? <laughs> the Bad Seed is based on both the book by William March and the play by Maxwell Anderson and was released in 1956 as what I think is the first horror movie about children. It got four Oscar nominations and is the small story of a family with an eight-year-old girl who really, really wants that penmanship medal <laughs> and will go to great lengths to get it. The father is away, and there is also a super creepy handyman who is always lurking around. There are lots of themes explored in the movie about family life, class, psychosis, nature versus nurture, and the origin of evil. So I'm going to turn it over and ask everyone what their initial impressions were. <laughs> uh, I really liked this movie. I had no idea what to expect. Um, I thought the acting was great. I thought for the for when it was made, which was what fifty six. Yeah. Um, thought there was a surprising amount of tension. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't help but think the whole time, like, what did audiences think of this? Especially considering how prudish people probably were. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a lot about it after the fact when I, when I read a bunch of stuff, but we can get into that as we go. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. I especially enjoyed, um, oh shoot, what was her name? Um, I mean, the your your Hortense. main character. Well, Horton oh. stole every scene that she was in, but I really liked uh, Christine. I thought Nan that she was incredible. Nancy Kelly. Yeah, Nancy Kelly. Yep. I already really love like fifties and sixties horror, so it reminded me of some things I already like. Um, specifically, um, the William Castle movie Straight Jacket. I think it has some similarities there, and then. Um, I love the Twilight Zone. That's probably what sort of kicked off this whole love of 50s and 60s uh, movies, but specifically horror movies. And it reminded me a lot of the episode um, It's a Good Life. I thought it was awesome. Um, all the acting was so good. I also loved um, Eileen Heckert as Hortense. She was my favorite. But I also thought Patty McCormack was, like, so cool. Um, and... Yeah, I hated her so much. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it was great. I also, um, just for this episode, I brought my tap sheet. Oh, oh my gosh, thank you. Are you going to brain one of us with those? Is there a uh, crescent shape uh, piece of lead on, on the, the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> I tried looking. I also, I took piano as a kid, and I, I swear to God, I played that same song that she plays throughout the movie, but... Oh. I only have some of my books, and I couldn't find the one with it. So, Well, that's amazing. Allison literally has a pair of tap shoes with her. <laughs> and I, now that she knows the song, I'm, having, I'm staring at Allison with strange eyes. Yeah. Um, this was also my first viewing of the movie. I loved it. I hadn't even seen a, a black and white film from the 50s in a while. So it was fun to be forced to like, hey, go watch this movie from the 50s. It was creepy. I didn't think it was that scary, but it was suspenseful. Again, the acting is so stellar, and I love how there are so few settings. It's all the reaction and the conversation. And I, I wrote down so many quotes from the movie because there were just so many lines that were so terrific. Um, I like a creepy kid. Like I like that trope in horror. It depends on how it's done. This one... Ooh, I love to hate that little girl so much. And I try to see the goodness in all children. But with her and those braids and those dresses, ooh, she was a real stinker. Um, but I thought it was a great film, and I was, I was really glad to watch it. So I'm excited to talk more about it. Yeah, I have to give credit to my brother and sister-in-law for turning me on to this movie quite a long time ago. And I have always enjoyed it, and I was so happy that we could watch this as part of this podcast. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I'll get into the scene by scene running through the movie now, and I'm sure we'll get to a lot of other points here. But you remember how the movie opens. So the movie opens with a very particular scene mm -hmm. of a storm at the uh, w at the wharf or the the little pier that's built there. I don't really know what we call that, but there's a, there's a little dock. They call on, it a wharf in the movie later I on. I thought yeah. so. That seemed like an odd that's way where the boy is. to to depict it. My notes call it the bayou. <laughs> <laughs> so in the book, they do talk about the bayou. So, what? but it's left very ambiguous. They mentioned the Gulf and the bayou, so you don't really exactly know what state this is supposed to be set in because they never identify the state at all. Hmm. But it's probably somewhere in the south, it seems, uh, wherever scuppernongs grow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Remember the, what is the, that? the scuppernong arbor? What? Yeah, the scuppernong arbor. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> I had to rewind it. I went, what the hell did they just say? I missed that line. Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> So no, we don't. What is that? Oh, is it it's, a place? It's scuppernongs are like grapes, I think. Isn't it? It well, what? is it the? It was the tree that she was sitting under, right? When she was in the backyard talking shit to Leroy. Right. Oh, when she was <laughs> reading, reading her book under the yeah. scuppernong tree. Yeah, right. <laughs> like when they start slow walking you into, hey, maybe she is a bad girl because right. she was talking shit to Leroy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So we don't find out the significance of that opening scene uh, for quite a while. But after that, we start to meet the characters. We meet this eight-year-old girl named Rhoda. And she's there. She's practicing piano. The father is just leaving, and he's off on a military assignment. We quickly meet Monica, the landlord, and we meet the mother, Christine, we also hear about two other characters, Emery and Reggie Tasker, that are coming later. So we quickly have a view of where most of the action takes place and most of the characters. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I was confused at the beginning because it starts with a bit of a storm. Well, like this, as far as people coming in, because the woman, Monica, the landlord, neighbor person who walks in she just bursts through the door says 20 sentences in a row and i'm like who is that lady why did she just walk in is that the grandma is that the aunt is that the neighbor why is she there but then after i watched the movie one time i watched the very beginning again and i understood she enunciated and i was able to pick up on her sentences and she totally set up like who she was she mentions that she's the landlord and then she sets up the scene with the um the criminologist or the psychologist, the people coming over. And I miss it in the first sitting. I was like, wait a minute, who is she? What's happening? And who is that guy? Oh, that's Leroy. Then I pieced it together. I mean, it's not confusing as far as the film goes, and it's not important. But at first I was like, wait a minute, how are these people all related? What are they doing? Right. I was confused by that too, especially because Rhoda calls her Aunt Monica. Mm -hmm. And so for the longest time, I thought that Monica and Christine were sisters, which I thought was... the exact same thing. Really? Yep. So it was really confusing later when Christine's trying to figure out, like, um, her family and if she's adopted. It's like, well, wouldn't Monica know that? <laughs> right. I, I, I had the exact same confusion, and I also just was looking at them like, their age difference is really big. Like, yeah. yeah. And so, it, but, yeah. And her coming in and spouting 20 lines is definitely, like, her M.O. She yeah. comes in and just basically dunks on her constantly. <laughs> Which, which I found really, I found it funny, but then it was also, like, th throughout the entire movie... Like everybody is coming in and just like, oh, Christine, oh, Christine, you know, just, just kind of treating her like she's an idiot. Yeah. Which was grating, but she also handles it really well. I don't know. I don't, yeah. One of my notes is this lady talks too much. Yep. It's like one of my very first notes. Aunt Monica. Yeah. Aunt she's Monica. a busy body. She's a landlord. She wants to be up in everybody's business because she, I just got that air, that, that air from her. That yeah. she, Doesn't she even say... Like, without even stopping to take a breath, she finishes a long, long monologue and says, and now I've talked enough. Someone else say something. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <she> say that? <laughs> and at one point, she, like, takes a drink or something, and you cannot tell what the fuck she's saying. It's mm -hmm. all just, like, garbled together. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of this movie, it's a dialogue movie. It's all sentences said to each other, and that is telling the story. Yeah. It's all, every sentence is important, the way it's pieced together. Right. And you can really tell that it's, like 
basically a filmed play because yeah. like in a pl- like in a stage setting that's all you have really because the set's not going to change all that much mm-hmm. so the dialogue's even more important and yeah. even the way that it's shot like you only really have like two or three locations mm-hmm. maybe maybe four mm-hmm. and they're all kind of set up like it would be in a play um, right and yeah. speaking of that house is beautiful and i didn't realize immediately that it was apartments so when they said that it was apartments later, all I could think was how now in whatever neighborhood that it is would be gentrified and it would be turned into a big, beautiful, yeah. open concept home. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. called Tidewater Arms Apartments. Uh, and I wanted to look up more into what is, I like that, Tidewater Arms Apartments. Yeah. Um, but I did think about that when I was watching it, knowing that it was, ba- and I didn't really read much about it beforehand. I waited till after. But Christopher had mentioned that it was based on a play, based on a book. And when you're watching it, you get the sense because of the limited settings and just the skillful acting and all of those lines. And plus, um, several of these actors performed it on stage hundreds of times together. So by the time they filmed the movie, they had worked together and they knew these lines in this story and those characters. So I can't, it, it was easier, not easier, but it was easier for them to be able to do that right. and be so successful with the acting. Right. And they have that great chemistry, I'm sure, because mm-hmm. they all knew each other and had played the role so many times. <clears throat> yeah, and there's so much emotion in this, which I hope we talk more a lot more about later because wow, that's what really got me in the gut was just the emotion of those two mothers. Um but yeah, so they're in the apartment and, and dad's gone. I was just gonna say though, isn't that really the crux of these great, great horror movies that we talk about? It's it's not just an external horror. You've got to really have these characters behind it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think all the movies we've talked about so far and this movie really do a great job of that. But we are in this apartment. And we quickly learn that Rhoda is very acquisitive. She (coughs) loves getting things. And that's really, I would say, it's really her motivating factor uh, for for the things that she does and wants in life. She just wants more stuff. And she is absolutely delighted when Monica brings her both sunglasses and a locket. And the sunglasses don't really play into the rest of the movie, but the locket does play a key Mm -hmm. role later on. So we learn that she's very neat and she just loves her shoes with cleats. And as Leroy says, she goes tap, tap, tapping around the living room, wearing those shoes with cleats. Fucking up that floor. <laughs> that, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Well, and her mother had <laughs> made them, her because she said it was, the girl went on and on about her mother, you know, put the lead on the bottom of her shoes and it was cheaper. <laughs> but there's a really beautiful shot when she has the tap shoes on in the living room for the first time we see her wearing them. And she kind of just like taps in a little circle. And then in the same shot, it kind of pans away from her and goes to the full scene. I just love that like eerie shot of her just like tapping in a circle. And I'm like, this girl is, oh my, it just, oh, I really disliked her so much. <laughs> I just, every, every sentence she said, I would just like nails on a chalkboard for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that first time she had that giant tantrum when she did not win that penmanship pin, she throws a giant tantrum and I'm like, okay, so this is how she is. And this is how mother and auntie Monica dote on her and let her do what she's doing. Right. Um, right. So I wanted to just say a couple things uh, about the scenes here coming up. First of all, the the idea of penmanship shows up twice in this movie. First of all, the character's last name is Penmark. Mm. And uh, Rhoda is so concerned about winning this penmanship medal at school, and she's very upset that she doesn't win it. So it turns out that the author of the original novel was really into handwriting analysis. The author in general had a lot going on, uh, as you might imagine, but he was really into handwriting analysis and considered himself quite an expert. Uh So it's kind of natural that he would throw this in. It's funny you mention that because I think I read online that there's a difference between the book and the movie in that in the movie it's just an award for the best penmanship but in the book, it's an award for the most improved penmanship, which hmm. I think is different. Um, and I also think it's interesting, like, you know, her name is Penmark. And so I wonder if she almost has this, like, entitlement that it should be hers. Mm-hmm. Um, and even when 
you know, she says it should have been mine or something. And the mom's like, oh, well, these things happen. You just have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't say, no, Claude won this and you got to chill out. (laughs) Well, because she is insisting that she had the best penmanship. Yeah. And she mentions that more. She brings it up again later on when the, the when the pin keeps coming up, that he we know that I had the best penmanship. I should have won. He yeah. lied. He cheated. Right. Right. When well, every adult that comes through her life just loves to say, "Isn't she just wonderful? Look yeah. at how precocious and wonderful she is." Look at that smile. Except for Leroy. Oh, yeah. Leroy. Oh she gosh. knows what she wants and she asked for it. Like, no, she takes it actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, man. If I could go back for one second, the tap dancing pissed me off, actually, because she's <laughs> not tap dancing. Like, the, that's not, they could have just taught her a basic, like, flap step or shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Like, it, uh, what is she doing? Well, they're she's not even real tap shoes. The back there's, only, on the floor. there's only one tap on each one, and the mom made them, so they're not even real tap shoes. There's a line that's like, you sound like Fred Astaire. And I literally <laughs> yelled, no, she doesn't. Like, what is this? But in the movie, honestly, she is she is um, she is pooping gold bricks in everybody's <laughs> eyes because she is so yep. amazing. So yes, she is dancing and tapping like Fred Astaire because she is the beautiful and amazing young, That's sweet right, <laughs> right, Rhoda. Yeah, she's a natural girl. That right. line is so weird to me. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so when this penmanship medal is brought up, it turns out that Rhoda did not win the medal at school. Another boy won the medal, Claude Daigle. And Rhoda really, really thinks this medal belongs to her. And there's a tantrum that Rhoda throws <clears throat> here. And I was watching this movie thinking, wait a minute, where have I seen this before? And I remembered a John Waters movie, Female Trouble, where Taffy is this little girl with pigtails and she throws a tantrum like this. So that led me down a whole John Waters rabbit hole of reading more and more about his movies. And I rewatched the scene with Taffy from Uh. Female Trouble, which is its own long, long discussion. But it turns out John Waters was heavily influenced by this movie and loved the bad seed and still does to this day. Nice. And he got to interview Patty McCormick at one point. Oh, really? Yeah. That's really cool. So uh, anyway, that's a a great comparison to look that up uh, on YouTube and watch that scene. It's not for everyone. I'll just say that. (laughs) I think that's true of most of his movies. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. After this, we really get more of a meeting with both Leroy and Leroy. I feel like we hear his name pronounced Both. two different ways yes. in yeah. the movie. Well, that's the director's last name. Yeah, but it's also his name in the book. So I thought that was connected. I thought it was like homage to the director, but it, mm. it's that oh. way in the book years oh. previous. Yeah, that's isn't that weird? R- it Ooh. was weird. Sounds something like you'd find in a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be. <laughs> um, well, because they call him Leroy, and I don't know if that was like their accent of how the the two women, um, the mom and Monica, if that's just how they spoke. They called him Leroy, Leroy. Mm-hmm. But then later on, I think that don't the men tend to call him Leroy? I someone does very clearly. He gets called Leroy more towards the end. Um, yeah, he's an interesting character. Right, and uh, I feel like maybe it's just Monica that calls him Leroy. Maybe she's from a different part of the country. I don't know. And she's maybe... just really tight with the director. Right. <laughs> well, they also are speaking in the way people spoke in the 50s. Like in the movies, they all had that movie voice. I forget what it's called. But it's just the way people were taught to speak in movies. Right. And so I feel like that's sort of carrying on that still in the 50s. So Leroy, no, I'm saying it. <laughs> Leroy or Leroy is the handyman or the super of this apartment complex. And Monica makes a point of saying that he has the mind of an eight-year-old, which is the same age as Rhoda. Right. So there's already this really odd comparison. Doesn't doesn't Monica also call him a sociopath? She has a whole sentence of like derogatory things to say about him when he's getting her tap shoes wet. Yes, and she calls him schizophrenic. Which, yeah, schizophrenic. Right. Why would you say a that? Whole thing. Like, right. Where right. are you getting that from? Yeah. He seemed, I had a really hard time trying to figure out what his deal was because half the time he just seemed like a normal guy. 
And then you'd say something weird about like the soldier boy leaving. Yeah. Ugh, what is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> s- the book is much more graphic with his oh. internal thoughts about the women in the house, okay. especially about Christine. It's, I would say it's a bit shocking. Really? His, his internal monologue of his desire for Christine. Really? Yeah. Oh. Well, Old oh. timey pervert. Oh, At no. the, well, And I wrote down pervert in here in the notes because you first meet him, you're like, oh, this guy, he's with all these ladies. He seems like a pervert. I don't know what his deal is. Is he, what's going on in his mind? And so I did pick up on the fact, I'm like, oh, he's a creepy, he's a perv. And then later on in the movie, when he starts having more discussions with Rhoda, and I'm like, oh, he's the only one who's seeing her for what she truly is. So then I started liking him as a character because he was bringing that truthful voice to what she really was. And he was he was battling her, and they were having those those crazy discussions in the backyard, um, not to jump ahead. But so I did totally pick up, and I have never read the book or anything, and so I did pick up on this sort of like subtle pervy thing about him and what, I'm like, hmm, I just had questions. Right. And I wonder if because it was made in the 50s, if they obviously they had to play that down quite a bit, mm-hmm. like any because they don't want to be, you know, what would be considered indecent at the time. Mm-hmm. But you can see almost in just the facial expressions because he's very hammy um, that that was probably how they played it up. It's just like, ooh, we'll, we'll get this guy to be very untoward and make faces like the Three Stooges do. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could definitely pick up though that he was supposed to be t- up to something kind of gross, a little smarmy. He would be played very, very gross nowadays if they made Creepy. this. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's even the very subtle scene of him when he first comes into the kitchen and he says something about he forgot his tools there. The way he's holding the handle, the long wooden handle of the, the window squeegee thing, and he's just slightly twisting it, it's really creepy mm. and weird. Um, I, I thought his acting was so good and yeah. so off kilter. Uh, yeah. He's one of my favorites. In yeah. The movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I, I watched the commentary track that was on the DVD, and one of the things that um, Patty McCormack said was that the guy who plays Leroy is such a great character actor, and you wouldn't know it watching the movie, but he was actually like a really nice man mm-hmm. in real life, and she really like enjoyed working with him. That's great. Apparently, he also was the radio announcer who reports the, the tragedy. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, which I wouldn't have picked up. Right. I also thought it was weird. At some point, Leroy says he thinks Monica's going to die soon. It's like, what? She doesn't seem sick or old. So uh, are you going to make that happen, bro? Or like what? <laughs> Why? Why well, do you think that? Could be like a misdirect. Yeah, and I, I think that gets into the ambiguous nature of Leroy. Like he is super creepy and he says and thinks these things, but at at one point later in the movie that we'll talk about, it turns out he might not be so creepy, and I think that really adds to his character mm-hmm. and yeah. the, the development of the plot. Yeah, it's almost like they want the... the I mean, I, I feel like we all have the vocabulary of years and years and years of horror movies and tropes and movies that we could pretty easily parse out that he was probably not going to be the bad guy. But um, if you were, you know, my grandpa in the audience in 1956 (laughs) going like, well, that guy is definitely the bad seed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's a red herring. Yes. Well, and I think that's, there's so few characters. And if you, if you're going, if they are describing it, who knows how they described it in 1956, but if you're describing something with um, a bad seed or if it's horror or supposed to be scary, as a moviegoer in 1956, and this movie was pretty pretty popular at the time, um, it did pretty well. And if you are going in there expecting something, there's so few characters, you're going to think, oh, is he the one? Is he the one? Is he the one? And we do that now with any movie we see. We're like, oh, is he the one? Is he the bad guy? And you're waiting for that twist and the turn and to find out who it really is. Because as, we, like, I can call us, like, advanced moviegoers because we've seen so many things over, like, the past hundred years of cinema. Like, what we've been able to watch and rewatch and digest and compare like this is, but again, it's because those those actors were on stage and it's just, I think he did a good job of coming in and appearing creepy and ambiguous and we want to know more, 
but yet we're focused on young Rhoda. Right. Because we know there's a bad seed. Right. Right. So. So at this point in the movie, we see the picnic just beginning and Christine, the mother, has approached Miss Fern, one of the teachers at the school, to ask about her daughter's temperament and whether she has any <laughs> friends. And it's, I thought it's handled so well in the movie where Miss Fern fortunately gets called away and she never fully answers the question about uh, little Rhoda's temperament. Uh, after that, Christine is back in the apartment, back in this familiar setting, and we have two guests uh, in the house. So we have, um, we have Reggie Tasker, who is a part of the detective club. I think he's an author. And we also have Emery, who is Monica, the landlady's brother. I think it's only in the book where he's called a larvated homosexual. Is that oh, right? That wow. didn't come up in the movie, did it? No, no, definitely right. not. Which, what a kind thing to say. All well, right. Oh, yeah. Also, what a term. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's larvated. A, <laughs> well, that's the that first means. time I've heard that. Yeah. Because well, right. you're, you're not out. If yeah. you're a larva, you're not. Right. Oh. Yeah. oh. Okay. You're still forming. So we have this kind of luncheon happening, and all of a sudden there's an announcement on the radio that a child was killed or a, f a child was found dead at this picnic and there's a lot of tension over who it could be and it turns out it was claude uh claude daigle, daigle yeah. the boy who won the penmanship medal mm -hmm. right um i thought the scene um at the picnic was so cool because you start to get a sense of the mom knows that there's something wrong but she like either can't face it yet or doesn't have enough pieces which when you find out something later it's like how did she not know this but yeah i just thought that was cool and it's uh yeah well and too as a mother i feel like she's looking for that validation of like is my daughter really as perfect as she appears does she have friends is she okay like i just saw it as like this mother looking for this validation of is she as perfect at schoolish everybody thinks she is at home mm -hmm. because again every adult who comes into that apartment says oh you're so beautiful and you smile and you're perfect and you're an angel and the teacher not really saying anything mm -hmm. is the first time that we're even introduced the idea that rhoda might be mm -hmm. a little shit <laughs> which she, she is, is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well and two i think the um the adult scene before the radio announcement when they're sitting on the couches that's when they have that conversation um where the the homicide guy, the chronologist or whatever he is, mentions the old case with Bessie Dakin and Bessie Dinkin being poisoned or the poisoning. And that's when the mom all of a sudden is like, I think I'm adopted. Like that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole scene that happens before the radio announcement. You're right. Right. Um, yeah. And that really and again, I didn't know who those two men were. I, d I was still piecing together who people were. Yeah. But then when the mom mentioned she thought she was adopted or I was like, OK, something's up with that. Take a note of that that line right so. yeah i was actually pretty tense during the scene with the, i didn't understand who those two men were until way later in the movie but i was so tense because it's um like very classic planting and payoff where in the scene earlier they plant the seed where you know she's she, the mom just straight up says there's something odd about her she's too mature like there's something strange here and then in the next scene i was so tense because they do the free association I was like, oh, my God, she's going to let it slip or she's going to say something really wild about her kid. And that's going to tip off all these other people that there's something wrong here. But that doesn't end up happening. Right. Instead, she focuses on herself and the dream she has and how she. But then also the name rings a bell when they talk about the name Bessie Dinkin. She's like, Bessie Dinkin, who is I know that name. Why do I know that name? But then she goes on to, like, get a drink at the table or something. Yeah. But again, these small little pieces because every piece is important like every line is so important in the set in the in figuring out the full the full story and right. there's so much foreshadowing mm -hmm. like not only are they talking about murderers but they're only talking about female murderers and they're only talking about female murderers who use some type of poison which obviously becomes a thing later um yeah there's so much planting and payoff in this movie right. which is great and very very briefly 
we see someone new in that scene who is Sweetsy the bird. Oh, right. And I misspoke earlier when I said we're back in our familiar setting. We're actually in Monica's apartment now for oh, this lunch. That's Monica's? We're oh, not. We're oh. not. We're oh, that's not, why the bird was there? That's right. It. We're not in Christine's apartment. We're actually back in, we're not back. We're in Monica's apartment, I totally which is where Sweetsy that. the bird is. Oh, oh. I don't even remember the bird being at, in the scene at all. All right. I remember is the it's bird coming up brief. at the end. Wow. That's remember, cool. Yeah, that's funny. I did I did I didn't immediately put together that that was a different apartment and I think part of it is in a in a more modern movie there would be a different color scheme yes. because yeah. it was black and white. It was just like this is but I also didn't put together again that this was apartments. I thought this was just a house. Ah. So maybe this was just a different room in in that house <laughs> where People just came into Christine's life again to dunk on her. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was just early enough in the movie where we're still trying to figure out who the people are. Why is Monica bursting through the front door? Like, where does she live? Where she's coming from down the stairs into a door. But right. then we learn that she's the landlord and she lives upstairs. Right. And there's sort of like a come and go as you please thing. Except for Leroy. He's got a knock if you don't before you, you use your keys <laughs> oh she, monica just gets on him so much yeah um okay yeah no i didn't even that would have never even come up in my brain i just right also to me it didn't really i guess it really doesn't matter yeah um in the commentary patty says that all of this psychology talk was really groundbreaking for the time which was surprising to me <laughs> because you listen to it now and you're like Wait. What do they know? Yeah. Like, what is this? <laughs> exactly. Well, and later it comes up more later on too, which I thought was really interesting. Right. Some of those conversations. Is this when they start talking about like nature versus nurture? Later on, it comes up. Ah, uh, okay. When like with her dad. Um, um. So we, on the announcer, Claude is dead. Right. So we find out who has died. <laughs> so one short little scene that I skipped over was when Leroy purposely <laughs> sprays water on Rhoda. Oh, I loved that. <laughs> Twice, right? Yeah. Oh, he yes. keeps going. Yeah. yeah. He does it after yeah. he's been caught. He's like, oh, yeah. I wasn't doing that. Oh, no big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he gets those tap shoes wet. Yeah. And Monica is not having it. And the mother's like, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> that scene was so odd to me because... For I have no idea why this thought popped into my head, but um, Monica and Christine and Rhoda walk away, and they, like, walk down the street, and I think some of them get in a car or something. But mm -hmm. when I saw down the street, I was like, oh, this is the Warner Brothers back lot. Yeah. I recognize this. Yep. Um, it's like the Midwest residential street. Right. Oh, that's where it was filmed. <laughs> and um, there's like a gazebo in the background. And if I am correct in where I think this was filmed, that's the Stars Hollow gazebo from Gilmore Girls. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. That's I don't bizarre. know why that popped in my head. It's so right. weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the scene of them walking down the street because also with this little girl, she's always in her cute little dresses with her cute little braids. And she's just skipping and being a happy little eight-year-old. But I like it that it breaks up the visual because so much of it, there's so few settings that these things are taking place. So the few that are outside, I thought were really well shot. Like there's several later that I want to bring up. But I did like the scene because the camera is lower to the ground and your eyes are on Leroy spraying those tap shoes. And those tap shoes are so in front of the camera, you know. Right. So again, with the foreshadowing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we learn about Christine's thought that she may be adopted or this this haunting recurring thought that she has and we go to the the picnic we find out that Claude Daigle has died now Rhoda is on her way home from the picnic and Christine the mother is very worried about how Rhoda is going to react to this death of her schoolmate on this class picnic and Rhoda comes waltzing in the door, totally blasé. I think she's complaining about her peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh, can yeah. I tell you a quote? Yes. Mother, we didn't have our lunch because Claude Daigle was drowned. Can I have a peanut butter sandwich? Then they have more dialogue. Mother is concerned. And then, then Rhoda says, I thought it was exciting. Can I have a peanut butter sandwich? 
And I was like, oh my dear, why is this child still alive? Right. Yeah. I just, but it was so, because it's so sociopathic and beautiful. Like that that line, like, I thought it was exciting. Can I have a peanut butter sandwich? As she's skipping around. Yeah. And she's just like, and they worked on him and worked on him and it didn't work. (laughs) It was exciting. Yeah. 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 He definitely died. (laughs) One thing that I thought about later um, when I was kind of pulling together my notes is when I watched this scene for the first time, Christine being so worried about what to tell her, I think that is like a pretty real feeling for a parent to feel because like death is like a hard topic to broach with your kids especially when they've like seen it Mm -hmm. like something has already happened and now you have to have a conversation after the fact but and and if it's a someone their own age like that's an even Mm -hmm. more fucked up thing to try to explain to a kid like hey you can die too yeah yeah oh yeah um but she's already killed someone at this point And Christine knows that, or at least suspects that. So why is she so concerned about talking to her? When did they not have a conversation before? Or I was just confused by that. Well, there's probably a lot of inner demons that the mother is dealing with as a parent of this young girl. And if she had any thought or inkling that her child had done something that terrible before to another human, um... Just all the pieces of being like, and I'm not a parent, but just the pieces of thinking about like how to discuss death with her daughter and then also like reconciling or thinking about the past. And the mom just knows there's going to be a lot of a lot of stuff coming up and she's sort of bracing herself. And you really start to see the mother and her like internal just panics and ha- trying to handle th- such deep things. Mm-hmm. I also thought it was interesting that Christine asked her if she's been naughty. Like she already... Yeah. Suspects. Mm-hmm. Well, she knows her daughter's a creep, and that's why she was asking the teacher. So the mom goes on and on and on and is trying to get out of her, are you okay, and blah, blah, blah. And the little girl is just skipping around. And then Rhoda says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't feel any way at all. Why should I feel sorry? I didn't get drowned. Right. Yep. Well, if she got drowned, she wouldn't be feeling anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> But she doesn't, because she's just like explaining, why, why should I feel bad? I didn't die. I'm skipping around. Right. So I think we, we start to see Christine's willful defiance of the facts and just kind of this willful ignorance that's setting in. And later on, I think that switches to some other kind of psychology that she's she's using on herself yeah. uh, mm-hmm. to get through this. Mm-hmm. I, I just have to say this is one of my favorite kinds of thriller horror movies, this kind of trapped sense that things are closing in on you because I don't know what it is. I feel like I'm in this movie. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the book, um, incredible Mr. Ripley. I also love the movie of it as well. I love strangers on a train where you are just trapped in this psychological situation. And I feel like as this movie progresses, it feels more and more like that. Yes. So, So the next day dawns in the movie and we're back in the living room and we have some guests that are showing up here. So Miss Fern, who is the school teacher, comes visiting and she, I think her lines here are great. They're so obtuse, so hard to fathom. She is both questioning Rhoda's innocence, but also being sure to say that is absolutely not what she is doing. (laughs) Right. And so she's showing up asking these very odd roundabout questions to Christine, the mother. And then in the middle of that, we have yet another visitor. We have Hortense Daigle. Scene stealer. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Unbelievable. Stumbles in, obviously drunk, (laughs) and and has some of the, uh, arguably some of the best lines in the whole movie, but also some of the, like, some of the strongest performances. Oh, it's so painful. You feel for her. You feel it. 
Yeah. Like I Even thought, though she's a little cartoonish. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> it is cartoonish, and I felt bad. Like, I thought those parts were funny, but were painful. And it's not just like, oh, it's a funny drunk lady, because she is... She is drunk because she's masking her pain. Um, what, there's another, it's a pleasure to stay drunk when your little boy's been killed. Mm-hmm. And she has, but the way she literally just stumbles in and you just feel that the, like the, the heaviness in the room of like what she's feeling. And then like what Christine is the, also what she, it's the, the two mothers in this are just phenomenal. Um, but Yeah. Yeah, I love Hortense Daigle. Um, her lines were what made me start thinking about, um, like, Rhoda's identity. And what I mean by that is, like, um, Hortense has lines that are like, you're a superior person. You've clearly always had a lot. And so I started thinking about class mm-hmm. differences mm-hmm. and how Rhoda can use her privilege as a um, a person with money I also don't think it's a coincidence that Rhoda is white. Um, yeah, I just thought that was so interesting. And I loved every time Horton Stegel was on screen. She's just, ugh. I like wrote on everything she said. I couldn't keep up with it. And then when she comes back later, even unbelievable. So it's funny. One of my favorite bits of this scene is looking at Miss Fern because she is so uncomfortable in this scene. She's sitting there totally mm-hmm. silent with her own suspicions, her own thoughts and things she wants to say. And yet she's also kind of just turning away from Hortense because she doesn't want to get all mixed up with this sloppy drunk over here, you know. And meanwhile, she's in the home of Christine and Rhoda. Ooh, she has her own thoughts about it. Mm-hmm. But she's just sitting here through this whole long spiel from Hortense. And I just was so uncomfortable watching her <sighs> in this scene. The only person that's even being a little bit kind to her, everybody's kind of treating her like that, except for Christine. Christine is trying to understand, but everybody else is just kind of shying away like, oh boy, she's a drunk. She's just running her mouth. She's a mess. Right. Well, Christine feels guilty because she knows her daughter might be involved, but also she needs to console this this mother who is in deep pain. But she also needs to get this drunk person out of her house because you never know how that's going to go if there's like a, an intoxicated person like in your home and like they could destroy anything or say anything. Or plus you're there with your kid's teacher and you think your kid just murdered somebody. It's like a lot. So I think the mom, Christine, did a really classy job of getting Hortense out. Yes. Were house visits more common? <laughs> like, because that I couldn't figure out why she would even show up at first. You and don't then... blast into people's houses all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, she says, you realize we followed you. We shouldn't have done it. I'm a little drunk. I lost my boy and I'm a lush and everyone knows it. So she didn't. Well, Horton says that. Yeah. The, right. the teacher. Oh, the teacher? Yeah. yeah. I guess she could have called. I also have a note that I just thought that the teacher's speculating about, like, what happened was super unprofessional. And I also loved that when she tells her that Rhoda's not coming back to school next year, she calls her a sore loser. Like, as if that's the reason why <laughs> she just, she's just bad at losing. <laughs> well, that is basically... First time somebody says something like that That's about the her. crux of yeah. her yeah. as a person, though. She loses that penmanship pen yeah. and boom. Yeah, you that's know? the first thing we learn about her. She throws a tantrum over that. Mm-hmm. Right. First and real thing I should say that we learn about her because otherwise it's look how great she is. Yeah. And the teacher probably sees more of it in class. Like anytime she doesn't do the perfect thing. Yeah. The teacher also tells Christine to smile at one point. I yeah. Was like, oh, She's so much prettier. No. You're so much prettier when you oh, smile. That's yeah. Just, just like, oh, I forgot about yeah. that line. That's yeah. right. I also think that Christine feels guilty, not just because of her daughter, but also because she's, she's looking at this other mother who has just lost her child. Mm -hmm. And I think there must just be some innate guilt when your child is safe and healthy and alive Mm -hmm. and another parent is here and their child is now dead. And I think that that just must be such a horrible, strange and guilty feeling. Oh, definitely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, like, 
I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I think the worst thing that can happen to someone is their kid dying. Like, there's just something that's not natural about it. It's like the timeline's gone wrong or something. Yeah. But especially when you learn that Hortense, like, she says that um, she and her husband married when they were older. Like, it was already kind of a stretch for them to have a child um, Mm -hmm. and that they will not be having another one. Like, their family line is destroyed and they can't get that back. Um, I also loved Hortense's line, children can be so nasty, don't you think? Because that's really like sort of the thesis statement of this whole thing. (laughs) And also, I know this comes up later, but I think it's another testament to the great writing of this show where we see Hortense flip quickly and she's like, and if you ever are short of money and you want a free haircut Mm -hmm. i'll be happy Mm -hmm. to give you one right and it's like people are complicated and i just thought it was such a realistic touch in there there's also that line christine says she'll have to live with this until she dies i think Uh, that also speaks to what you were saying about mm -hmm. like hortense's life from here on out right I forgot to mention that this is in the previous scene, but I laughed a lot at the idea of somebody roller skating and eating a sandwich. <laughs> she said that she wanted to take her sandwich roller skating with yeah. her, and that feels like a choking hazard. <laughs> oh, totally. But, but you know, if you've just murdered somebody and then, you know, you're feeling good and you really, you feel great. You want that sandwich. You're carefree. You want that peanut butter sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Got my medal. Gonna eat my sandwich? <laughs> that She's was a great scene, <laughs> and I didn't mean to skip over totally that. Forgot but yeah, <laughs> forgot to mention that. Oh, and I like man. how she's got the skate key, and she's like tightening her skates. I thought that was really sweet. Yeah. See, all I could think of is, oh my god, she's yeah. gonna trip on an uneven side. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, isn't Leroy out there too watching her do up her skates so she's sassily got her sandwich and skating off? Exactly. Yeah. I think she says something shitty to him too. Oh she, yeah. Oh, she does. They she's do. She's like yeah. f off, and then yeah. she rollerblades yeah. into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> she does seem to be a better rollerblader than tap dancer. Yeah. Well, there is one part. I don't know when. There's an early reference around the time before Mrs. Hortense co- or before Hortense comes in, where Leroy says, "I'll find a way to scare you." Oh, right. Yeah. So, which is a cool thing to say about a kid. Yeah, the jig is up. I know what you're up to, kid. I'll find a way to scare you. I thought that was a great line. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> So, I think it's still that same day that somehow it gets, we learn that Claude Daigle, who died, has crescent-shaped bruises on his, on the backs of his hands and on his head even, which is pretty horrific. <clears throat> we don't know what caused those bruises yet. Maybe was it Hortense that revealed that? Or? Yeah, because she says yeah. something about how the doctor said he must have bled before he died. Right. Which, ugh. Right. Also, just having picked up my tap shoes earlier today, it it would take a lot of force to kill somebody that way. Yeah. Um, Especially on the front of the head. Yeah. yeah. Even to leave a mark, you got to be hitting somebody really hard. Right. Right. And then she like stood on his hands when he was trying to climb back up off. Under the wharf. Right. With her heels? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. They were yeah. only on one part of the shoe. Right. So at some point, Monica comes in and says, oh, I have I need that locket because I'm going to go get it fixed and I'm going to add another birthstone to oh, it. Oh, right. Because she wants the garnet and the turquoise. That's right. right. And Rhoda gets what she wants. Yeah. Yeah. She knows what she wants and she... Asks for it. Right. She's such a natural girl. (laughs) I don't know if it's just in the book or if it's in the movie as well, where Monica says she's not like one of those girls that needs therapy to decide if she wants chocolate chip or like mint. Yes. (laughs) That's great. And that got me thinking about like Rhoda's identity too, because there's so many lines about like, she doesn't want to wear blue jeans like the other girls or, Mm -hmm. you know, she's such a natural girl. She always wears dresses. Like what is, what is this person saying about her gender and like, pushing away those sort of typical gender norms. But she's also a murderer. So right. I just, what does that mean? Right. Yeah, well, too, it goes into, like, psychosis and, like, mental illness. And if, um, 
when they get more in, at the scene earlier where Christine was trying to figure out if she was adopted. And they, you mentioned this earlier, Allison, where it was a female serial killer. Um, so there's mm-hmm. a lot of like, it's almost like they're going into like females being the ones that are, you know, mentally ill and doing these things. Right. Which I imagine was probably a, 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 a new or a novel concept mm-hmm. back then. I imagine that a lot of the ideas in this were probably taboo, which is why they they bring it bring it up the way that they do. At the end? Yeah. I kind of thought it was refreshing because um, like in the episode, It's a Good Life, It's a Little Boy. I feel like that's much more common it's for um, like a male person to be violent or a serial killer. Oh, totally, whatever. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's fascinating that it's a female and it's fascinating when it's a child, even now. Right. Oh, Not yeah. fascinating in like a great way, but it's just, it's, <laughs> right. it is interesting. It goes against the norm or what. I mean, it gets people's attention a lot more because mm-hmm. kids are supposed to be innocent. Yeah. Not bad seeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in movies, I feel like in movies, if you want to talk about like the, the quote unquote creepy kid movies or the killer kids, there's plenty of, of male and female children that are doing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And they're both good and creepy in different ways. Monica is back. She wants to borrow the locket so she can have a new stone put in. And Christine goes to fetch the locket. And in doing so, she d- is digging through Rhoda's treasures. And she finds Claude Daigle's medal. <gasps> she makes a great face. Yes. It's so funny that she's shocked by it, though, because as soon as, um, what's the landlady's name? Monica. As soon as Monica comes in, she's like, I want the locket. I was like, oh, shit, here we go. She's <laughs> going to find it. Well, you knew that because that was that was the reason for her to go in the treasure box. Was she, You knew she was going to find them. She knew she was going to find that penmanship pin in there. But when you do, it just sets it up for her, like, oh, man. Like, you know. Yeah. But I think one cool thing about the scene before that is you never see Rhoda fiddling with her treasure box. She walks into her bedroom. She immediately puts her skates on. I think the camera pans away or cuts away, and then it goes back to Rhoda, and then she leaves her bedroom. And it's like, so the viewer really hasn't been primed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to know that there's something in there. At least for me, I wasn't. And I thought that was just a cool touch. Yeah. Christine confronts Rhoda. And wants to know why she has the medal and how she got it. That's a great scene. And now we start to see Rhoda flipping out more. And she immediately goes into her super precocious, I've got the best (laughs) mother. I've got the prettiest mommy. Oh I couldn't God. even with that. And she very, were, very slimy stuff. And she had her yeah. hands all over her face. I've got the yeah. prettiest oh. mommy. And I, ugh. Ugh. yeah, ugh. <laughs> yeah. You just feel like you feel like Christine is just like a hostage in that second. Yeah. Ugh. Well, she's so easily manipulated. Yeah. It's, ugh. She's so manipulative. That's just the same thing with the hugs and the kisses and the baskets. It was so much so that I st- I started to guess, like, is is this a movie where Rhoda is actually, like, an adult? So in that scene, though, when she is asking her about the medal, that's the sa- is that the same scene where she asks her about the woman, yes. the, their former neighbor, their former place falling down? Mrs. Post. And she steals the, the globe with the fish. It's that same bed- bedtime conversation. But I don't think Christine is buying it this time. No. She really, really wants to know what's going on. However, Rhoda really manages to buffalo her again Mm -hmm. and really get out of this one by saying she couldn't tell the truth because, oh, Miss Fern would just doesn't like her and would never believe her. Remember her excuse of how she got the medal? (laughs) She said she gave Claude Daigle 50 cents to he, let her wear it for the rest of the day. Uh, and when she's going through and describing this, she's just like going about her business. Like she immediately, like she takes such a long time to start concocting her lie that you can tell that she's calculating it as she's kind of goading mm-hmm. her mom along and talking about how, yeah. how cool she is. We move around in the room. We move up to her room, I think at one point while she's, while she's making this shit up. So she's really good at manipulating her mom. Mm-hmm which just tells you that she probably does it to her all the time and always has for 
eight yeah. years? Is kid, she eight? Kids yeah. learn, yes. even if the ch- a child is not a sociopath, kids learn how to work their parents and they know how to, I mean, they're always, which is what kids are supposed to do. That's just what they do. But Christine being like so intelligent and such a manipulative sociopath, she's even better at it than the average eight-year-old. Um, but no, Christopher, you're right. It is that same scene. And I forgot that it starts downstairs because the, the mom says, I know you're an adroit liar, but I must have the truth. Like she basically says, you're a liar. Just tell me this one time the truth. Did you murder this child? Did you take the pin? I'm and waiting that's for when, your answer. And that's when she starts in with the, the prettiest mommy and the nicest mommy. And okay. at some point, the mom says, get away from me. Yes. Because she can't even handle being in the room because she knows what her child is and it has done multiple times. And right. she can't. And you really start to see that mom unravel and just start understanding and knowing what's going on with her and her daughter. And it's, it's so intense. It's so intense. Right. But that when she's concocting that lie about the 50 cents, you, you can just see her almost looking away, thinking in her head, Mm -hmm. what now, how can I get out of this? Mm -hmm. And it's so cold and manipulative and it's just beautifully shot too. Because she's, I think she's playing with her teddy bear or something. Something or like that. She's yeah. setting out a doll or something on her bed. Yeah. And yeah, it's wonderful. But this is enough really to placate Christine. Yeah. Weirdly. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, but also at this point is when she um, wants to meet with her dad and ask her dad questions. Right. After, because I feel like that scene is sort of like a bigger setup for her emotional and physical state, for her wanting to find out like more about how could this be happening. That's right. I'm glad you reminded us of the fifty cents line because that sort of, like, <laughs> like hurt my feelings. Sort of watching that because like we learn in that earlier scene with Mrs. Daigle that like one their family doesn't have that much money. And that she was, like, super proud that Claude earned that penmanship award himself. Like, it seems to have been a big deal in their family. So then for Rhoda to claim that she could buy him off with 50 cents to wear this thing that he, like, so, Mm -hmm. like, worked hard to earn. Um, I just looked it up. 50 cents is, like, five bucks today. Right. Like, oh, yeah, I'll give this, like, loser five bucks so that I can win, like, the pin that I'm supposed to have anyway. Mm -hmm. Ugh, gross. And when you're eight, why, like in that time, why would you have that kind of money? It's yeah. Mm-hmm. So before the dad comes over, that other guy comes over. Oh, the the uh, Christine's dad. The writer, the criminologist writer guy that they had dinner with earlier. Right. Right. Yeah. So Reggie. Oh. That's right. Reggie Tasker is over, and Pops comes over. He is an odd character. He practically comes in the door and says, hey, darling. Yeah. Hey, baby. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> with the dad or the, the, the writer? The dad. The dad. <clears throat> well, the conversations with the writer before the dad, um, that's when she starts asking about, like, children. I'm writing a book. <laughs> yeah, she wants information on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> she uses that as her device to ask questions about child murder. Yeah, it's so thinly veiled, too. Yeah. She's yeah. like, hey, uh. Uh, <laughs> Say, if I was going to write about this really specific thing. Yeah, if yeah. there was an eight-year-old girl with blonde <laughs> pigtails yeah. uh, who murdered somebody the day that... <laughs> and a basket of kisses. and Because yeah. <laughs> well, she basically is asking him, like, do children commit murders? Like, right. do they actually commit murders? And then he, she gets information from him before she goes to her father asking about, like, lineage and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. I did not know, like, it took me a really long time to figure out that... Christine's dad was what a criminologist or a writer about like true crime sort of stuff. I understood that he was famous from one of the earlier scenes, but it took me just like basically until this scene now to f- figure out who he really was. And same. Once I did, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so is one of if her dad's a writer and a criminologist guy, and then is who is the other person who I called the writer guy? He's also a writer. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. how they know each other. I think of okay. detective stories. Right. Okay. So there's the writer guy and then the dad. Okay. Yeah. And I think the dad is more broadly famous for all kinds of different writings. I think for things he wrote during World War II as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Well, and I loved it too when when he finally gets over and she wants to get that information about um, like are bad children or criminal children the product of their environment. I also love how there's like 
19 gin and tonics. Like they have two sips and they're like, I'll have another. Top me off. Very fast. And I'm like, what are you guys? All, first yeah. of all, they're in these giant glasses. And I'm like, what are you mixing? It's like a little science experiment back there. And they need a new glass every five seconds. He didn't stir his either. And I, and I immediately thought that that was going to be a bad drink. <laughs> well, they, he had like seven gin and tonics. <laughs> right. Basically, they're having this like nature nurture conversation. Can children commit murder? Let's have a 19th gin and tonic, please. Right. I think our next episode should be called The Bad Seed Drinking Game. Oh my goodness, yes, please. We just drink whenever they're drinking. Every time Hortense gets a drink. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Well, she's a bourbon and water lady. (laughs) That's right. Back to the point of how everyone is kind of uh, not very nice or doesn't treat Christine well. What does the dad say? about Christine when when Christine says, I'm thinking about writing a detective novel. The dad says, Christine? She can't even spell. Oh, oh that's right. God. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Another Ouch. person dunking on her. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that that scene really stood out for me. But we begin to get this debate over nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. That is, are things genetic, nature, or are they nurture the environment? The dad in particular is on the side of everything is the environment and that it's impossible to be a born anything, a born murderer or a born whatever. And that seems to be the, the ongoing opinion of the experts in the movie. The doctor at the end of the movie says the same thing, that it's got to be strictly environment that causes everything. And the dad has the same opinion. I don't remember. I think Reggie Tasker feels the opposite. Isn't that right? I think so. He, I think he's at least open to the idea that some things could be genetic or nature. Is that correct? Right. I, I think don't quite remember. So, and I think it's, I feel like it was, I feel like it's lines just to introduce doubt in the audience or, you know, it's like all of those conversations just kind of feel like they're to move the audience's opinion around on if Rhoda is really bad mm-hmm. or not, but, especially early on. Because right. there is obviously a turning point where it's like, oh no, she's definitely bad. We know for sure she's bad. But before that, any of those conversations are like just to, to steer the audience. Well, and two, the mom is looking for that yes, no answer. Like, even if you're in a beautiful, lovely home, can you still have a child who's going to commit murder? Like, the mom is still grappling with that, and so she's looking for answers. But at the end, um, with the doctor, when um, children can inherit criminal tendencies in their blood, so the doctor has the opposite point of view. The dad is talking to the doctor, and the doctor says that to the dad. That's That's why. Okay. Because the dad is the only other one who knows what happened or who knows that... um, Right. That she's a bad seed because she knows that her, he knows, the dad knows that his adopted daughter is the child of, is a child of a serial killer. Mm-hmm. And so the dad says, or the doctor says to the dad, children can inherit criminal tendencies in their blood. So the dad is seeking, or he's getting that information, but the dad's not going to share it because he, because he knows that Rhoda might be not okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I must have mixed that up. Right. Yeah. I remember oh. that conversation now. That's right. But I forgot right. it was the dad and the doctor at the end. Right. But right. either way, they're still trying to figure out that conversation of can children commit murder, nature, nurture. Right. So at least we're, we're getting this point in this open debate about, you know, is it environment or is it inheritance for, for all these traits? I just think it's so funny. They think they have to choose. Because I think, right. don't we know now, like, it's both. <laughs> it can be both. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I also think it's interesting, like, that line that you said um, about how they can, like, inherit criminal tendencies in their blood. Like, that's not true, but you definitely, like, can inherit mental illness or, like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, sociopathy sure. or psychopathy is just, like, a chemical imbalance in the mm-hmm. brain. So, of course, but it also is often, like, triggered by, I think, childhood trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, we know that they, that this movie is not exactly the foremost authority on <laughs> mental illness when they when Leroy is talking about schizophrenia and, or when they're yeah. talking about schizophrenia earlier because obviously the definition of that 
Well, plus, it's a movie in 1956 based on a book that came out before that. So right. it's a very different time to be discussing all these topics as well. Written by smoking doctors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He goes in there for a light. That's the conversation at the end. Yeah. He goes in there for a light and the dad gives the doctor a light. And then the doctor <laughs> says, yes, criminal tendencies can, can be in your blood. Right. <laughs> Let's have a smoke. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, after all these doubts are starting to creep in and Christine is really wondering and getting nervous, mm-hmm. um, I think it's, is it the daytime or the evening when we see little Rhoda carrying a package, sneaking, 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 trying to get out the door and I think at this point, Christine is a little more wary of her uh, cherubic daughter, and she chases her down. They have quite a struggle, which I thought was fantastically acted. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that this inside this package are the shoes. Right. And suddenly... Christine has a revelation and she realizes, oh my God, you're trying to burn the evidence mm-hmm. because these shoes have crescent taps, tap soles on them. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, because Leroy told her that the bloodhound, the, 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 the blood oh, stick hounds yes. are going to come get her. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that yeah. great back and forth between them in the backyard where I learned that Excelsior was not just a thing that was shouted in a cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... She gets gifted a tea set. Her father sends her a tea set. So she takes a tea set into the backyard and she's having a mock tea party. And that's when Leroy is back there, like taunting her. And, tea, and they're having that whole back and forth. And he's kind of telling her about there is evidence and you've got to get rid of the evidence. And you then the next scene, she, wash. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love that with the, the bloody <laughs> stick. And she's like, what do you mean you can't wash out blood? Yeah. Um, and that's when she wants to destroy the, the te- she's just, she's eight and she wants to destroy the evidence. So I thought. I also like that Leroy is the one. He knows what she's up to, and he's also telling her how to get rid of the evidence. Right. And then she's just like, well, I know you sleep by the furnace. <laughs> yeah. So, so fuck you. <laughs> yeah. I do like that Leroy's like, you can't fool me. I, I love know. that. Yep. And I also think it's interesting that the only person who can see her for what she really is is like a lower class person who nobody else like trusts mm-hmm. or right. believes. Those scenes between Leroy and Rhoda are so mesmerizing. Yeah. At one point, he's just going on and on, trying to get her attention and get her goat. And she says, you talk silly all the time. And it's, and then at one point, she's totally ignoring him. And then she looks up at him when he finally says something that might be accurate that she's really not sure of. Mm-hmm. And it's at that point, Leroy knows it's like, aha, I'm onto something here. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. also the, it's the first time that the audience can see the non precocious version of her. Almost like, like you were saying, the scene where she is, where she's caught with the shoes is the first time that the audience is seeing for sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Rhoda is definitely not good. Yeah. There's no longer a question of that. Now we just have to see how this plays out and and how her mom deals with it. Right. Because I don't know how I would deal with it. Oh, man. Yeah, and what does her mom do? Well, <laughs> after that whole scene, they they have, you know, another argument, and the mom says, you've got to get rid of those shoes. And, but before, I think before that happens, don't they have a discussion about Mrs. Post mm-hmm. at, at this point? I think Rhoda is just leaving the room and Christine, the mother, stops her and says, now just tell me, was there really anything else that happened with Mrs. Post? And Rhoda says, no, that was all. She just slipped down the stairs because it was icy. Mm -hmm. And then she suddenly changes and she says, except that I slipped into her on purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. Looks S- so good. Such a great scene. And this is one of a few scenes that is so much more effective in the movie than in the book mm. because there are a couple scenes that they draw out so long in the book and the sudden 
realization of some of these things in the movie is so much more striking and effective. So. Well, and the movie is, I feel like the movie is pared down. You, I mean, the movie also is two hours. I think a two hour movie in 1956, that's a long Not movie. Not common. That's yeah. a long yeah. movie for that time, yeah. but it's coming from a play and in a play can be way longer. And I feel like if there's other pieces in that book that could have been in it, I mean, I don't know how they would have, they really, yeah, I don't know how they did it. Um, but even after, but there's another great scene after she tries to burn the shoes, the mother knows she, the mother's going to say, yes, burn the shoes. And then she's also, she's back in the air doing a puzzle. And then Leroy finds her again. And he's like, you know what? I saw what you did. You put those in the incinerator and I took them out. I've got those shoes. They're only a little bit charred. And then she really freaks out Mm -hmm. because she knows that he's onto her and, if he's got the shoes, that's the evidence, and she doesn't want him to have the evidence, so she just throws a huge fit. Give me them shoes. Yeah, yeah. And the mom's I want like, those I, shoes. Well, the mom's like, I told you not to talk about it, and she's like, But he had the shoes, mommy. But what does Leroy do? Remember that he suddenly spins and he says, "I don't have those shoes." Oh, right. Yeah, he, yeah. He tricked me. I was just it. fooling you. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, earlier he doesn't quite know how it happened but he's just sort of speculating like oh i heard you fought him in the woods and i heard you used a stick and Mm -hmm. you know that's when he sort of like hits on that point where she kind of lets slip a little bit what she did do Mm -hmm. um but one thing i thought was really interesting was after they have this whole conversation where you know leroy says that he knows road was mean because he's mean too and it's like this very tense conversation where like he knows what is up now um, Christine comes out and she yells at Leroy for talking to um, yeah. Rhoda, but Rhoda covers for him and she's like, oh, it was my fault. Right. Um, I just thought that was interesting. Like, why? And the other thing that I thought was cool about that scene was um, it, that was the first point where Rhoda is shown to be such a great manipulator, but she's still eight and hasn't hit that developmental stage where she can like plan things out. And so she's so obvious about some stuff, you know, she like, she lets slip when she could have just like lied about it or said, I don't know what you're talking about again. And then she goes right inside and asks her mom, Hey mom, is it true? You can't clean blood off of something you killed somebody with? (laughs) Like she has no self-preservation, which I thought was interesting. Like she can't think far enough ahead to cover her own ass. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, she's eight years old. Well, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Which made me think if she grew up, like what would she be like in her teen years Mm -hmm. when she does finally get to that developmental milestone when she can do that? Like her grandmother. You know, right. getting to assume identity and moving to Australia. Yeah. Um, did we mention? We did we. So when the mom was having that discussion with her dad, that's all that came up about the history of Bessie Dankin. Right. That that famous case that he worked on, and she was the serial killer that moved to Australia, and that's when she finds out that that was her, her mom. That's later. That's yep. later. Because they have a. They bring her up earlier in the first, like, act, and then they bring it up again later, yeah. and that's when she learns Bessie Danker was her. And when they first bring her up, they do that little cut to the dad who kind of, like, looks over the paper that he's reading or whatever, and almost like, a, oh, shit, hey, shut up, don't talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they, and obviously that's to make us go, wait, why did he do that? Oh, first, yeah, first. And then later on, they have We have, have to get ice cream and get the matches. Okay, I gotcha. The matches. I wanted to go back just for a second, Oh, and, though. and Mrs. Dango comes back. <laughs> <laughs> but when Rhoda is burning those shoes, there is such a beautiful filming f- shot. Yes! Such a beautiful yes! shot. Oh, I noticed that, too. Yeah. So what we see is we still see Christine in the background, and we see this long hallway, and we see Rhoda coming out the door, she opens the door, she's in total silhouette, and she dumps the shoes into the incinerator, and then the camera pans up. And I think one reason it stands out so much is because there's so little of that in this whole movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's very little camera work, and this really, I thought, was a striking scene. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I also noticed that, and it was especially noticeable because for the most part, this is just a filmed play. 
Mm -hmm. um, which is great, but it has like a very particular style. And this was the first shot that was like more cinematic with like the camera actually moving as opposed mm -hmm. to having just the one camera in, for the most part, like a solitary, like stationary position. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So when we did have those, those sweeping pans or there were different things happening, like that's why I noticed at the very beginning when she was tapping in a circle in a pan from her to going, are you in little things? And that's such a small part. But there's so few quiet moments in this movie. Every single scene and dialogue has so much intention. Right. There's not a lot of room for that. Those fancy pans. I'm still putting air quotes around tapping. <laughs> <laughs> tapping? <laughs> Sorry, Allison. <laughs> so we're starting to set the stage for the end of the movie. We see the father buying that tea set and it is shipped with all this excelsior and the excelsior is kind of wood shavings to ship precious things. Ah. And so at one point Rhoda gets the tea set, the excelsior is all over in the yard and Leroy is asked to get rid of the excelsior and so he puts it next to his next to the furnace, I believe, in the basement. And that's one place that he sleeps. Mm -hmm. So we see where the Excelsior has gone. We also um, have another visit from Hortense, I believe. Yep. So Hortense comes calling again. And she just wants to interview or talk to Rhoda and Monica comes in. Is this right? Am I yes. screwing yeah. this up? This Rhoda goes to get ice cream. This is when I realized Monica wasn't related. Was right. the scene. <laughs> <laughs> like almost at the end of the movie. Right. Yeah, and the, the ice cream truck. And then Rhoda wants ice cream. So she goes outside to get a popsicle. Oh, right. And that's when she takes the matches from the table to go out to get her second popsicle. Uh, right. Right. That's right. She gets caught taking like... 20 matches and then she's like all right i'll put i'll put these back and then she takes three and there's a shot of the three matches wow. in her hand as she goes at the door which is beautiful it's so right. good yeah, she's yeah. and so when she's door. getting ice cream is also when mrs dago comes because then her hands are sticky and then when monica takes her away she's like, oh, we'll wash up upstairs that's right on her way to her other social engage in, engagement that Monica just made up. And I love when Hortense goes on and on about her and her social engagement. Uh, yes. <laughs> social I, obligations. That's what it is, right. I didn't know Rhoda had all these social engagements, traipsing all over town with important appointments. If you know what I mean. <laughs> and I think, yes, we do know what you mean. <laughs> important appoint appointments to murder. <laughs> Um, yeah, I love that when, again, another great scene with Hortense when she comes in. Hi, I know you don't want me here and I don't want to be here, but I can't stay away. So I got a little drunk and came over. And then it's just, again, it's not like silly and funny. It's just so heartbreaking because she doesn't, she knows that her, that, that Rhoda was the last person to be with her son when he was alive. And she knows there's something, she wants more information, but she also can't handle her grief. And so she can't stay away. So she got a little drunk and came over because she right. can't handle it, you know? Yeah, right. And then poor Christine is trying to console her, but also feel this terrible guilt of, oh, it's just so terrible. It's just, it's a great scene though. It's a great scene. So going back to, to the scene where Christine realizes that her daughter really did kill Claude Daigle, at this point, you know, a thoroughly moral person would say, well, my daughter's a murderer. I have to call the police. What scene are you talking about? So going back when the shoes are revealed and she has this sudden revelation, oh my God, it's the shoes, the crescent shape on the tap shoes before she tells Rhoda to burn the shoes. Going back to that scene, uh, a thoroughly a moral person would call the police and say, I think my daughter killed someone. But in fact, we see this kind of parental instinct kick in where it's like, I've got to protect my daughter and I will never let them hurt you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such an interesting switch, even though this is the thing she's been most horrified and most worried about 
the whole movie. Mm -hmm. Now that she knows it's true, she's flipped. And she's like, okay, I won't let them hurt you and I'll protect you. And uh, I, I just think it's, it's part of her kind of <laughs> psychotic journey as a, as a parent in yeah. this scene. This was something I kind of struggled with throughout the whole movie is trying to figure out, you know, a lot of the movie puts you in Christine's shoes. And if I was in this situation, what would I do? Um, and one thing I thought about a lot is like, um, when Mrs. Post died, would things have turned out differently if Christine had intervened sooner? Because she already has suspicions a year ago is when that happened. Um, and like, you know, kids are sociopaths, like, or not all kids, but there are <laughs> all kids. All children. Who, are <laughs> <laughs> there are kids who are sociopaths or psychopaths. Like there are kids who are born like that. Um, like that's a real thing that can happen and that could be a real worry for parents. But th the thing I wonder about is like now there are therapies that can help with that sort of thing. What resources would have been available in 1956? Yep. I don't know. Like it, are your options like – um being put in a home for the rest of your life, lobotomized, um, jail, like wh what can she do? Right. I don't know that I would choose to be an accomplice, right. but it, her options are limited. And the other thing I think about is like, it's 1956. Christine can't even open a credit card in her own name. You know what I mean? She's like, she has very little agency as an adult woman. What chance is Rhoda going to have? Mm -hmm. especially as she gets older. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. It's like, what are the options available to her? Mm -hmm. You know, electroshock therapy, uh, you know, just have her child sent away forever. Mm -hmm. And I think you do get a little begrudging sympathy for Christine. It's like, this is her only child. Mm -hmm. You know, if she could prevent it from happening in the future, what decision should she make mm -hmm. you know it's, so, compl it's complicated call the police <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's 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 the one <laughs> yeah well and i think too i mean christine has a lot going on too so even if you like we talk about like getting help for rhoda like christine has a lot like at this point she's alone her husband is gone it's just her and this child and She's questioning like her parenting and she's questioning her child. Like at the beginning, this is not the first instance that she's doing it. We're just coming into her life at this point in time. But at the very beginning is when she's already going to the teacher and asking her, you know, how her, how Rhoda is in school. Is she nice or does she have friends? Because she's trying to piece together because she's no, know, she knows things about her daughter and she's coming to grips with that. So she also has a lot going on. And even and throughout the whole movie, like she has several little breakdowns over what's happening. And so at the end of the movie, the mom is completely not okay. And like, you know, she needs, she needs, she needs help. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mentally, like it's, yeah, there's a lot of mental illness going and a lot of, a lot Plus, of pain. Yeah. Her dad doesn't even know that she can spell. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> I did think it was interesting though, that once, uh, Christine and her dad have a couple conversations about it. At one point, he says something along the lines of, like, what's Rhoda done? And he starts looking at her different. Like, I feel like he pieces it together way quicker than Christine ever did. Well, because he knows, from he's known the whole time that, that um, his the grandma is a serial killer. Like, right. he has known the whole time her lineage. I wonder if it's like a ticking time bomb sort of thing where he's been waiting yeah. to see if this he happens. wants to know he's like oh what's happening now what's happening what does she do let's go is she on cue with what she's supposed to be doing next right. how many bodies yeah is it right. is, is it serial yet <laughs> past past the gin and tonics like <laughs> <laughs> well it also makes me question like what side of the nature and nurture uh debate was the was christine's dad on earlier do you remember i mm. thought he was on the side of nurture Okay, that makes sense for his history. Right. right. So why would he take Christine if he thought she was going to, yeah. Right. I think he says, somebody says they can turn out that way even if in a nice home. Or can they turn out that way if they... 
I like thinking that um, when they moved from wherever they lived, where, where Miss Post was, they looked at uh, Tidewater Arms Apartments and were like, well, this looks really nice. We got to get her in here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I too like, and we didn't mention, but the conversation that for going back again, where she's talking to her father about the nature and nurture, that's also when it comes up about um, being a bad seed and what is a bad seed. Like they mentioned the word bad seed a couple times in the movie, and that was one of the first instances of. Right. What, so when she's talking to her dad again and there, she really demands to know and she says, just tell me the truth. I think he's still lying to her. Mm -hmm. And finally she says something like, I, I have the answer I needed. And then the, I think the dad is pushing her more on what name do you hear calling you? Mm -hmm. And she shouts out her name and then she realizes that her mother was Bessie Denker. Yeah. yeah. Her name was Ingold Denker. Ingold, right. And the scene where Christine starts punching her stomach like it's her ovaries. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Is that a fantastic scene? And she's so distraught at who she is, who her you know, finding out her identity and then realizing that in her mind she has passed down this horrible, horrible legacy to her daughter who is a murderer. Why didn't I die to end the agony? Yes. Right. Oh, my God. I also wonder, um, like, one thing I thought about that I thought was kind of interesting was this idea that it would skip a generation like the grandmother was a serial killer. Christine is not. Rhoda is. Um, but I almost wonder, like, once she has this realization that this is what her lineage is, is that when she decides to kill her? And, like, in doing so, that generation is not skipped anymore because she is also a murderer of her own child. That's right. Mm -hmm. she I think just, she's saving her, though. Yeah. I, I'll she's, save you. By killing yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I have a couple of quotes, too, that she says. I don't know how far we want to jump ahead if we're going there yet. Um, so Leroy is dying in the fire. Do we talk about that? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Right. And then, the, yeah, the piano. And then we, got, then we go into the whole thing with the mother deciding that. Right. So we're at the point in the movie where Christine has, uh, excuse me, where Rhoda has just stolen those matches. Oh. And she's headed out the door. Ooh. And... Christine, the mother, fully understands who she is and who her daughter is and this horrible family legacy that she's really the daughter of a serial murderer, a famous serial murderer, this woman, Bessie Denker. And the Excelsior has been put away somewhere uh, in the basement mm -hmm. where Leroy likes to sleep. So I have an inkling of what's coming. And in the middle of another luncheon, oh my God, it's such a great scene. We hear someone shouting desperately for help. Yeah, and somebody, somebody at one point says, it sounds like there's a fire. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't know that that's what I would have thought, <laughs> the sound of a man screaming, but... Um, because <laughs> isn't Monica run through the apartment too? Like they're all looking out the windows. It's like, do you see? Right. You're just looking out the right. window. <laughs> also, man, what damage that would have done to the house, really? Yeah. A fire in the basement of a house. Yeah. Oof. Well, it had those like t those trap door, storm door things on the outside. That was also another like, you know, foreshadowing moment of. Yeah. Right. This is a little embarrassing, but um, I didn't realize that Leroy was downstairs in the like furnace area for some reason like i thought that um rhoda like shoved him down the thing that she put the shoes in oh, oh the incinerator, the incinerator. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome <laughs> i also love that we never see rhoda doing any harm to anybody we never see her hurt anybody there is no violence there's no direct violence on right. anybody on any you know and I think this scene is even more effective for just hearing Leroy screaming. We don't see a thing. We never, as you said, we never see Rhoda doing anything. 
It's just the aftermath all the time. And seeing Christine's face when she's just like, I, he's, he's not moving anymore. Like, and she's horrified and, and that, that's, that's all we get to see. He dies very quickly. Like he's like moaning and screaming and then like, oh, he's dead. Right. He's not yeah. moving anymore. Yeah. And then Christine starts banging her hand. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. What a great touch that is. I also love the last one where like she's hitting the top of her hand on the desk. And then the last one, she like swams it so hard. Like, yeah. dang. Yeah, How that, many times did you film that? Oh my mm-hmm. God. That yeah. scene is so intense. And then with the daughter in the locked room playing the piano, it was so... Oh, yeah. And the like mom faster, just faster. full on just has a complete meltdown. It's so intense. And I I think I even started to... There was one point where I started to cry. And you just felt Aww. this like... And this was, this was shortly after also the scene, another intense scene with Hortense going on about her son. So there's so much like motherhood pain happening within the short 15-minute window of the movie. And that's when I just started feeling so so much of it and when the mom is banging and screaming and freaking out and then the daughter is in that room playing the loud piano and it's so it's like just everything's hitting her it's just slamming her in the face and she can't take one second of it anymore and that's yeah i couldn't even yeah. ugh, it's like sensory so overload absolutely and it was really well done because as a viewer i was in that i was like oh stop it make it stop make it stop <laughs> well imagine how intense that was as an audience in 1956 like th- that at that point probably hadn't been exposed to too much stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Oof. Well, there was one, I watched the little 15 minute documentary with um, Patty. What's her name? Patty McCormick. McCormick. Patty, when, in the interview with her where it's basically just her talking for 15 minutes. And she was talking about um, the play and the performances. And she mentions the, the performer who played Hortense and, how amazing she was because she, for doing up over 300 performances of this, to go back to that grief every single night, she was just in, and she was a child when she was seeing that happen, but she was saying that as an adult actor, knowing what that actress had to do to go on stage every night and feel that grief of losing her son over and over and over and over, it was, I was just like, wow, that's so true. That's that's amazing. Yeah, I think she got nominated for an Academy Award and then won a Golden Globe. Yep. Yep. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I love, Christina has a line that's like, it isn't what she's done, it's what I've done. I just thought that was like really nice. Right. That Yeah, that says a lot. Personally, well, I would have liked to see Leroy burn. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a 2022 I was going to say, uh, in a, a, in a <laughs> modern movie, it would have been grisly, and we would have seen his skin falling off. Because yeah. <laughs> you don't, again, you don't see any violence. You yeah. don't see, it's all in your mind, which is right. so, it makes it even creepier because you don't see it. You're imagining and feeling it. It's, you, you feel it. It's so visceral. Yeah. Um, but after Leroy is um, no longer breathing outside... As a viewer, I'm like, oh, great. Well, how are they going to know? How are they going to find out? How is the truth going to come out? Because you still have so few characters and you have this big thing going on between the mom and the daughter where you know that she's the murderer. But how is it? What's the resolution now that, you know, Leroy is the only one who knows outside of them the truth? Right. Well, Mrs. Daigle would have figured it out, too. I like to believe so. Right. And Um, I love Leroy because there's no bullshitting with him. Oh, yeah. He'll just tell you right what he thinks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll find a way to scare you. (laughs) I'll get you my pretty. <laughs> One thing I wanted to mention is in the commentary track on the DVD, um, Patty McCormick mentions that in the stage play, every time that song is played, dun 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 dun, it's Mr. Daigle playing it off screen. But then she had to learn it for the movie because she couldn't fake. Oh, she couldn't fake I saw it. That. So yeah, she had That's to cool. learn how to play that, which I think is cool. Yeah, that is cool. But it's too bad no one taught her how to tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> Allison's writing a letter after this program. <laughs> Dear Patty. <laughs> <laughs> so after this horrific death of Leroy, the scene changes back to Christine reading a bedtime story to Rhoda and everything is calm and peaceful. We don't, we don't immediately know what is going on. I have to admit, I even thought maybe they're in jail. Like I, I had no idea what was happening when the f- scene first changed. 
when they were on when she was on the couch. Right. I just I just didn't know what was going on if they were in the hospital or you know what was happening. Well, there's a scene right before that when the mom talks about saving her daughter. Mm-hmm. That happens before that because she has to make the decision to kill them. Oh. There's a thing um, <clears throat> where the mom talks about protecting her daughter. Um, she's my little girl and I love her. Right. Um, you're mine. I can't let them hurt you and shut you away. No one can save you unless I save you. Sleep, my love. I shall sleep too. And then it right. goes to the scene with them on the couch. So she's made that decision after she has that. She wrestles with that internally of how to end it and how she's not done enough to protect her daughter. And so her way of protecting her is to kill her. Right. It's funny. Like you can tell that this used to be act one, act two sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's so many like mirrors. But I remember in the first part thinking... All right. Why am I watching a scene of them eating vitamins? Like what? But it's like planting and mm-hmm. payoff for this mm-hmm. scene here. Right. right. And then when um, Monica brings over two bottles. Right. Yes. Rhoda loves that apricot yeah. juice. <laughs> 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 and I, when she was drinking it upstairs earlier, when she was going to bed, she was like drink, taking vitamins before bed with her for juice. And I was like, but honey, you brush your teeth before bed. Now you got to brush teeth again. Exactly. <laughs> and juice by the bed, you're going to get bugs in there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Tisk. Yeah. 1956. Yeah. <laughs> I also have a note here. Rhoda wants the medal from her tap shoes back. LOL. What a petty like, souvenir. You can have anything in the world. Your family is rich. They'll give you a garnet and a turquoise. But like, do you want like some shitty medal your mom put on your shoes? Right. Yeah. But also, I think it's interesting that Rhoda takes uh, little souvenirs for like. She takes, um, shoot, what's it called? A fishbowl. Um, trophies. Yeah. She yeah. takes trophies like a serial she's killer. A, she's a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. her treasure box. Next is right. an ear. <laughs> so, Christopher, sorry, we derailed you. Bedtime story. The mom decides she needs to take care of her daughter by letting her sleep. Right. Bedtime story. <laughs> so, Christine has given her daughter lots and lots of sleeping pills that she got from Monica earlier in the movie and Rhoda goes to sleep and we see the mother leaving the, uh, leaving the bedside. She goes into her own bedroom and all we see is the hall and Christine walks into the bedroom. We see the door close and then we hear a gunshot. So we understand that Christine has just killed herself or tried to. Yeah. I was so mad here because I've seen so much Twilight Zone and I was like, you got to wait. You got to make sure. Ooh, sorry. You're all right. You're okay. <laughs> you got to make sure she's dead, dude. Yeah. What are you doing? Like she gives her 10 seconds and then she's like, bam. She carries, See you later. She carries her upstairs and she goes to her room. But again, it's a movie. Oh. It's a movie. It's a two hour movie based on a play, based on a book. Um, but but that gave room. It gave room for like, but is she dead? Who is mm-hmm. she or is she not? I right. knew. Yeah. Oh, I was so mad. <laughs> oh. Come on. Like, yeah. finish the job. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, she didn't. I know. That whole next scene, I was like. <sighs> yes. So not only is Rhoda perfectly fine skipping and hopping up and down the halls of the hospital. Surprisingly, for somebody that had just been dosed with a shitload of sleeping pills, <laughs> she's yes. just like, yeah. I'm fine. It was a, they said it was a lethal dose. Yeah. But so the thing is, so if the mom would have just taken the sleeping pills like she, her daughter would have, there's a, the idea that her and her daughter both would have died. But since she um, chose to shoot herself, the noise of the gun alerted the neighbors. And that's when Monica came in. And that's how they were able to save the child from this lethal dose and how they were able to get the mom to the hospital to maybe end up being okay after shooting herself in the head. So I thought that was also interesting because if she would have just taken the pills, then there's a chance they actually both would have died mm-hmm. without alerting the neighbors. I did think it was a little bit funny how Rowan is like, wow, I have to take a lot of vitamins today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do love my apricot juice. Yeah. She's so precocious. <laughs> <laughs> but she says, could I see the bottle? Yeah, right. Because she's even getting suspicious of her mother, I think. Yeah. It's like, let me let me look at that vitamin bottle. <laughs> yeah. And they could have really played that up and done more where she was questioning her mother. And her mother really doesn't have these motives till towards the end. 
But you really could have played, if she's a, a sociopath and as intelligent and as Rhoda as she is, you know, if you think of other kid killers and they they start doing those kinds of things where they're realizing, oh, that the adults know what's going on now, let me try to trip them up. And so that was a good little, right. there wasn't a lot of that in here because there really wasn't much room until the end for that. So that was great that they had the, the, her check the bottle for right. sure. Right. Yeah. So Rhoda is just fine and Christina's in the hospital and she, it looks like she's going to make a full recovery. Incredible doctor. Yeah. <laughs> also, the, the dad has come home by this point to deal with the whole situation. That's right. Also, he's pretty not too broken up about it, in he my opinion. saying they're in love. We were so in love. I didn't yeah. understand the thinking behind that. Well, because she tried to kill herself. Yeah, just to be like, everything was fine. I, you know, <laughs> like to try to give this image. Of, everything was just fine. I have no fucking clue what's going on at my house. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> really, gone for months. Because yeah. really nobody knows why nobody except for like the dad and Leroy would have understood anything that's happening in right now. So I can see why the right. dad trying to explain to everybody in the hospital, like, hey, everything was fine at our house. I don't know what's going on because he really literally doesn't. Right. He has no idea why. Um, I mean, who even knows did the... They don't know that the mom gave the daughter the sleeping pill. Like, it, none of that is known. So the right. dad just has to say, like, I have no idea why any of this is happening. Because nobody does, except for the dad and Leroy. Right. Yeah. And Leroy is no longer with us. And the us. dad doesn't want to say. Well, right. But the mom is alive, so. Right. And if I remember correctly, it was painted pretty early that the dad is pretty absent. Because when he's on the phone call with her, like, he... He like very specifically doesn't say he loves her back, and like mm -hmm. so you're immediately like he's aloof, he's away, he doesn't know anything that's going on. He might actually not know anything about what Rhoda's doing because it seems like maybe I'm making a lot of assumptions here, but because of his military career, he probably yeah. has n very little to do with her life anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think too, in 1956, it would have been painted where the father doesn't do those types of thing at home. The mom takes care of the home. The right. mom knows what's going on with the child and he's off, you know, at the office or doing his thing. Right. Um, there is that great scene earlier where um, the mom goes to call the police or goes to call and she's talking to her husband. He's not there. Like she wants, wants to call Washington DC and she's just hysterical and she never connects with him, but she, cause she knows she can't tell him, but she just has that moment of mm -hmm. on the phone of trying to express herself. And I, that's another, maybe that's the scene that made me cry. Something made me cry, but that was beautiful where she's trying to reach out, but she, she doesn't and no, she can't, but yeah, she's still. And then when the operator comes back and she goes, Oh no, that was a mistake. Canceled the call. Yeah. 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 Um, but that was a really good scene again with the mother, Christine, just, and oh. it, it also ties into what Christopher said earlier about feeling really isolated. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, she tries to have a conversation with her dad, but she isn't able to say, she isn't able to be fully honest with him. She tries to call her husband. And she doesn't even bother connecting mm -hmm. with him. But it's also like, who can she turn to? Her options seem so limited. She has right. none. Only I can save you. Right. You know, no. I can't let them hurt you. No one can save you unless I do. Right. Sleep, my little one, and I'll sleep too. So, towards the very end of the movie, we see Rhoda at home again. Rhoda's going to bed, and Rhoda's dad is there. Mm -hmm. That's Christine's husband. And the husband is just tucking Rhoda in, and they go through their familiar, what would you give me for a basket of kisses oh. routine? And the this end conversation is awesome. So there's a conversation about Sweetsy, the lovebird that Monica has. And tomorrow they're going sunbathing. And it's revealed that it's a very secluded place. And Monica has promised Sweetsy to little Rhoda if anything should ever happen to Monica, if she moves or dies or goes away. I think she or said is... if she dies. Right. Yeah. When, right. she, when Monica dies, I get the bird. Right. Do birds outlive How humans? How long do birds live? <laughs> <laughs> Again, she's just so obvious, you yeah. know? Right. She can't. But the dad uh, doesn't know. The dad literally just right. got there. I just, I just think like... it's... <laughs> and 
Doesn't Rhoda say something like, well, we'll find out tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking of like sunbathe on the roof way up high. <laughs> yeah, right. What do they yeah. call it? A sun a sun bath? Sun yeah. bath. Yeah. Sun right. bath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's arranged a sun bath for me. Isn't that lovely? Because <laughs> yeah. that's how she talks. Yeah. Oh, God. God. <laughs> yeah. But is that the point when she's putting her to the bed? Is that when the dad gets the phone call and then finds that the mom is okay? Was it before or after oh, that? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the mom, I think, tries to deliver a message but doesn't really get it out. <laughs> right. That was how I read that scene, that the mom is trying to warn the dad, but she doesn't really. Right. That makes she, sense. She does say something, but I don't remember what she f- conveys. To be fair, she just got shot in the head. Yeah. <laughs> shot in the head and just a bandage took care of it. Yeah. Yeah. And her face still looks beautiful with all she the bandages great. all yeah. around it. She's sleeping oh peacefully. Um, there's no there's no bruising. There's no anything. Right. Again, incredible doctor. Yeah. But don't they say something about, um, and that did remind me of like a Twilight Zone where, oh, she's fine. Yeah. But that, doesn't she say something about like, I just, they're professing their love for each other? I think so. Yeah. I Maybe that was all that was there. And is that in her... Is that in her cut when, when Rhoda is doing what she's doing at this point with the boots and going outside? Yeah. So right now, well, after the dad goes to bed, little Rhoda gets out of bed, puts on her clothes, and we know that she's headed somewhere and we don't know exactly where, but I think quickly we remember where she's headed and why. Mm-hmm. So she's headed to the pier to look for that metal. Right, because Christina put it back. The mom threw right. it in there. Right, she took it back there just be like, yeah. Well, because at one right. point somebody, I think I think Rhoda asks her mom, Mommy, what did you do with the pin? If the pin is evidence too, what did you do with the pin? And the mom says, don't worry, darling, I threw it in the water by the wharf. No right. one's going to find it. Right. Which is so funny, like, Wait till these people find out about fingerprints. You know what I mean? <laughs> they already don't know about blood sticks. <laughs> blood sticks. Um, and stick blood hounds. Yeah. So that's right. Stick blood hound. Um, so that's how she knows that the pin is in the water. But it's a beautiful scene. Like when she is putting on her mm-hmm. galoshes and her hat and her raincoat and she's got her flashlight and she is heading out into the rain. It's a beautiful scene of her uh, walking down the street to head mm-hmm. towards there. Again, because it's just a variety that we haven't seen. There's not a lot of action shots. And yep. I just love that scene. And that's yeah. what I really like that a lot. And so being, if you're up to something late at night, don't run the fucking mm-hmm. flashlight along the fence. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that she was doing that. I loved it. The, I wrote a note about the flashlight on the fence. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's so, I wish there would have been more. And again, it would have been a five hour film. Um, but it was so beautiful. The, the visual of that black and white. Mm-hmm. And that clink, 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 clink. Yep. Yep. That entire wharf set was built in a sound stage, like that big lake area, wow. all of that. That's cool. Yeah. And I liked how the very end shot was like how it was at the beginning with the storm and the wharf. But it's almost an act of God. I know. Oh, it is. The whole time they're like nature or nurture. And at the end, God's like, it's nature, bitch. Psst. God killed her and I laughed. Yeah. It was, I, I didn't expect that. I loved it. Yeah. Did I, you guys think that was going to happen? No, no. I laughed a lot. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't think. She, I thought she would be alive and we would be so. She would just stay alive. and yeah. We'd be so mad that, you know, the mom was going to end up dying or something. No one was going to find out. She's going to kill Monica. And she's just going to become a serial killer, move to Australia like her grandmother. And it was so great when she just it was yeah. such a surprisingly abrupt way to end yeah. it. Like even though it was you were obviously at the two hour mark, I felt like there could be so much more movie where they were going to show uh-huh, Monica uh-huh, being thrown uh-huh. off a roof, which I would have been all in for. Yeah. <laughs> and so for it to just be boom, lightning strike, the end. I yeah, I I laughed at that a lot, and I really liked it. Yeah. It was very satisfying. Like I didn't expect that, so it was very satisfying. I was, like, really upset about the ending because, like, the whole time I I knew she wasn't going to die. I've seen too much Twilight Zone for the episode to end this way. Then she's, like, she's clearly alive the whole time. They have this obvious setup about the sun bath and how she's obviously going to keep killing. I was just so upset. Like, she's like, oh, okay, this is how it's going to end. 
And so when she got struck by lightning, it just made me so happy. I was like, yay, I like this movie again. Good. This is nice. It was just a great ending, and they just ended it. There was no expository. There was nothing. It was just like a zap. She falls in the water. Hopefully she had the pin in her hand at that point, that penmanship pin. (laughs) Yeah. Well, apparently that is a major difference from the book and the play. And actually what's funny is as much as we like a lot of this stuff, the reviews at the time just lambasted the movie for doing that. Oh, really? Actually, most of the reviews of the time are super negative, which I thought was really strange because I figured this was a like a shocking, like really interesting movie. But most of the original reviews that that I could find, like there was one in the Village Voice that called it, um, what did they call it? They called it ostentatious and insincere. Huh. And it was it wasn't until years later that people started to come back to it and really enjoy it, which is strange. But at the time, it was people were familiar enough with the play that they were angry that it ended differently. Mm. Um, well, we do that today. Yep. You know? Yeah. I think we did that a couple episodes ago. <laughs> well, the film I mean, the, I mean, the film was pretty popular the year it came out, though. Yeah. It was definitely popular with yeah. audiences, but, like, the, the critics said that they, like, the thing from Time Magazine was they thought the director thought that the subject matter was too strong for audiences to handle, so he dumbed it down. Oh, I which see. Which probably was true. Well, because, Christopher, you mentioned that even, like, with the Leroy in his internal dialogue. Oh, Yeah. Well, how does, does anybody know how the book ended or how it differed than the movie? Yeah. The, yeah. Go ahead. You read the book. You should. <laughs> well, <laughs> so Christine dies and Rhoda lives uh-huh. in the book. See, that's what I thought the ending was going to be. The only reason they did that, though, is because of like the Motion Picture Association's code, like the Hayes Code wouldn't allow that to be on film. Yep. Which is funny because it would have been fine on TV. What wouldn't have been allowed on film? Um, the idea of um, like... Mm- a uh, criminal going unpunished or like oh. that and sort of spe- thing. And yeah. specifically children. Yeah. So they thought it was in bad taste. Like there's a, it's like a censorship organization called the Production Code Administration. I'm not sure if it's still, I doubt it still exists. Uh, now I mean, that makes sense. No, it turned into the else. MPAA and now it's yep. just the MPA. Right. Yeah, but it's, right. it, the Hayes Code became like um, the GPG right. R okay. and right. then they added NC-17 and PG-13 later. Well, I like how Killing a child at the end is more up to code than letting the <laughs> the, the murderer go free. <laughs> well, she was a she was a bad girl. Yeah. She was a bad. She seed. was a bad seed. She was a bad seed. Oh, yeah. But she had great penmanship. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> she had some good qualities. The, the phrase "the bad seed" just cracks me up because, like, what is a bad seed? Is it mm. one that doesn't germinate? She's right. alive. Is it a seed that turns into an evil plant? An evil like, plant? What, right. what does it right. mean? The evil rhododendron. Oh! <laughs> uh-huh. 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 Oh, my God. That's funny. <laughs> I wonder Dropping if that's intentional. That's interesting. I don't know. I just thought about it, but it sounds right. I like it. Um, well, they, they mentioned the bad seed, I think, at least three times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They mentioned, was what's her face? The grandma, was she, like, someone, the... Christine says, was was she a bad seed? Was Bessie a bad seed? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the mom, and she just wants her dad to say, well, yes. Right. She was your grandmother, and she was a bad seed. And then she they all look at the camera. <laughs> yeah. I love a titular but, line. But the great the great <laughs> ending. And then, do we need to mention what they do after that beautiful scene where yes, the curtain we, dies? Yeah. I love it. I loved that. I, I that, made me, that made me laugh. That made me smile No, before the curtain call. Oh, what are you talking about? They where they ask you not to spoil the movie. Are oh. you talking about that part? The part where that says you have just seen a motion picture uh, that handles like intense yeah. themes or something like that. You have just seen a motion picture whose theme dares to be startlingly different. Right. May we ask that you do not divulge the unusual climax of this story? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, which is every movie should have that. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, and then the curtain call, which uh, is, it is. You know, normally I don't want to feel jovial after yeah. a horror movie, but I think it works really well for I en- me. I enjoyed it. And actually, like, maybe the thing that struck me the most in that, other than obviously her getting her, getting spanked at the that end. That was so weird. Um, <laughs> was uh, you got to see um, 
kind of the real nature of the guy that plays Leroy, yes. where he doesn't he doesn't seem like an idiot. <laughs> he just he even says, like, I'm Leroy. You can see his mouth moving right. saying, I'm Leroy. <laughs> Leroy. <laughs> I liked it because they were stage actors. They were yep. doing their curtain call. Right. And you got to see them in a different light. And also, I was like, and I liked the way it visually looked. And I said, hey, I want to do that in some videos at the library for other things. That right. looks really fun. <laughs> um, but I don't... I don't I, just thought it was weird when Rhoda was on the mom's lap and she was spanking her. I know it's 1956 and that was like the funny tongue and she like, oh, you're a bad seed. I'm going to spank you because that's what we do in the 50s. But I was, I was just like, oh, I don't like that part. I guess they did that in the play too. <laughs> oh, really? End. Yep. Uh, well, yep. I guess, I mean, she's a bad seed. You're a murderer. Right? Probably get you a, get a spank. Yeah. And that probably got <laughs> a, a big couple of laugh, spanks for that. I would assume. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Especially because the ending of the play seems so much more depressing. Right. Um, I don't think any of us on the Saturday show are going to spank you, Amanda. So. <laughs> Please don't. For murder. Right. Yeah, right. What? <laughs> We're not going to introduce murder a little. There'll be murder. another mystery episode. <laughs> oh. I like that scene, but I was like secondhand embarrassed for Rhoda. Yeah. Just knowing oh, that yeah. she's 10. Like, yeah. 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 Her skirt's pretty short in that part. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. she, wasn't she eight when it was filmed? She was eight when she did the play, but by the time the movie she was, was filmed, she was ten. She was pretty tall. Also, with her perfect little pinafore dresses and her perfectly, you know, plaited braids and her bangs, I couldn't get the image of a young Carol Ann out of my head from Poltergeist because oh, yep. she's had that perfect oh, tiny yeah. little girl, and she wasn't like a murderer. She wasn't a bad seed. She was a good seed. Right. Um, but she had the the perfect hair and the, you know, the cute little cherub little girl, and so. For me, it just added that level of saccharin just to have yeah, right. Rhoda look like that and just her hair was not, those braids were never, there was never a stray hair in her head. Right. Yeah. I thought, I how did they do those braids? I didn't think about that, but I did think about like, um, I can totally see the connection between Rhoda Penmark and something like um, a Draco Malfoy where it's like that blonde, mm -hmm. like sort of like, mm -hmm. not he's not evil, but... Evil, oh, Drake like was brat. evil. Drake, well, full, Drake was an evil brat. In the beginning, yeah. Or like a um, Joffrey Baratheon. You know, same sort of deal. Blonde, oh, yeah. rich, and that murderer. is exact. And that, I'm glad you brought that up because that is my hatred for Joffrey and what I felt when he was on screen is what I felt when Rhoda was on screen. I disliked her so much. Mm -hmm. I, her hair, her every single little, everything about her, which sounds really awful, but... You, that's a great movie. That's a great character if you have that visceral of a response. And Joffrey yeah. gave me the same thing when he was on screen in Game of Thrones. Yeah. Right. Or Draco didn't because he was a kid and I knew what was, I felt, felt for him and I knew there was some redemption upcoming for him. But Joffrey, I was like, uh, -uh off with his head. With this girl, I was like, uh, uh off with her head with those braids too. Yeah. yeah. Well, Draco's more of a bully. He's not a murderer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you see soft spot. We can, sorry, sidebar by Harry Potter. But also there's there's <laughs> scenes where you feel where Draco, he's a, he's a wuss. He's a sniveling wuss. Yeah. And he wants his, you know, other friends to take care of things. And he's afraid Hermione and whole. But he's got the he's got the hair and he looks like Joffrey. Um, I think that's one of the things that makes Rhoda such a great character, though, is like, I wasn't scared of her mm -hmm. personally. Oh, yeah. But like... The way that she manipulates people is so true to life. Like, mm -hmm. that's how people actually get what they want in real life. Like, they're using their privilege right. um, to get what they want, and they don't care who gets hurt. Um, so, yeah, I hated her so much because she's just such an accurate portrayal of real human mm -hmm. behavior and psyche. Mm -hmm. Right. I think she's a really good example. Like, if you want to talk about other movies that had these um, these bad seed, these murderous children. She's a great person to put in put in a the file with all of those kids. Just it, it's just a different personality and it's just portrayed in a different way. And I think that's really good. And plus too, I like the fact that you never see her do anything specifically violent with her hands. Mm -hmm. You know, because she's just that manipulative and Right. Yeah, just the violence of her feet, her terrible <laughs> tap dancing. <laughs> but you don't, they don't even, but the thing that's amazing too with this movie is, in since this is from a play, there's no flashbacks. So this would have been written for a movie, They were, and then she was talking, there would have been a flashback to her hand, her feet, her tap, she's been on Claude Daigle's hands as he was trying to crawl out of the wharf. There would have been back Back, or what do you call them? Back flashes? Uh, flashbacks. flashbacks. Oh my goodness! There would have been black flashes. <laughs> there would have been flashbacks in the in the movie. There would have been a visual of those things popping in. And so with this one, it's so different because it's so based on the play in the play format. 
So it's left all up to the viewer to visualize all of these acts of violence and terror that are happening, like, you know, outside of the mind. Right. I'm also glad that they didn't show very much because the special effects in the 50s would have kind of ruined it for me, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think of something like Psycho. But also, also too, and I know there were some issues later about, like, children performing those acts in movies, which there was a bit of a poo-poo about that. Um, Like, if you think about... um, Pet Cemetery in Gage, who was like two, mm-hmm. and he's supposed to be murdering people like with a scalpel. He's literally a two-year-old baby, and he's supposed to be the one doing the murdering. And they mm-hmm. do a really good job of it. But for the the later on remake, like it's not a two-year-old, you know, it's an older girl. Yeah. So they trained because it's just again different times where we're like expecting and we're palpable or accepting of different things to be on screen. Right, right. You know. I did- I did think a lot about other, um, like, evil kids. And what I thought was interesting about Rhoda and the Bad Seed is that she just is like that, whereas most other evil kids are possessed by something. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, I'm thinking about, like, the Exorcist or the Omen. Omen. Like, they are the Mm -hmm. Antichrist or they have been possessed by some, like, no, it's just her. It's just her brain chemistry. Yeah. And they give you a little bit of an of an explanation that I put quotes around with with it like oh she comes from a the lineage of a serial killer, but it but again it's not a supernatural thing. It, they try to explain it as a essentially a mental health issue, and I I think that makes it worse in some ways. Mm-hmm. Like oh there's no exercising you, there's no curing you of something it's you Mm -hmm. right it's like oh so it's totally hopeless a lot darker right well it makes it feel more real it's it's reality it's not a ghost or you're not a two-year-old come back from the dead and that's why you're murdering people right like it's literally just it's real it's It's, more real it's real and it's a situation that someone could find themselves in Mm -hmm. at any point in time Mm -hmm. right there's so much like ambiguity and like mystery about like I mean obviously I'm not a parent but like you don't know how your kid's going to turn out and you can have Mm -hmm. the best of intentions you can do everything like quote unquote right and Mm -hmm. you really don't have that much control over your child nature nurture yeah (laughs) and God (laughs) that like (laughs) please that needs to be (laughs) (sighs) Um, but yeah it also it thinks about like if this is a horror suspense film um, we don't see, there's no, like, specific visual act of violence. So the horror is, it is a true, it's a horror because it's so much closer to, to real, to reality. So I just wanted to mention a few quick differences from the book. Mm-hmm. Of course, the book is going to go into more detail and changes some things. We get a little bit more of a backstory with a lot of the characters. Uh, but one interesting difference is Christine practically watches Rhoda set the fire at oh, the end. So she really, it all just unfolds. Instead, in the movie, Christine just hears someone calling for help. Mm-hmm. And also, Leroy never, ever had the shoes in the book. In the movie, he actually goes into the incinerator, finds right. the shoes. They're just a little bit scorched. <laughs> they did that in the movie. There's a visual of him going in the bin. He's it, saying they didn't do that in the book. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. So in the book, there are no shoes to be found, which is, I think, really interesting mm. uh, for the plot. And Richard Bravo, the dad of Christine, is dead in the book. Hmm. You know what's weird is I thought he was dead while I was watching. The, I have a note about it. I don't know what gave me that impression. I mean, I was confused about basically everybody in the movie who wasn't like <laughs> Christine Rhoda. The four or, other adults. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's funny because to me, the dad seems really thrown in. And I think his acting is more wooden mm-hmm. and just the character and the interactions I almost don't fit as well for me. Mm-hmm. And so I think it, it kind of makes sense that the dad was written in for, mm-hmm. uh, for a later version. Well, it makes sense to, he's sort of a, a plot device where you, he you need, they get the information about the 
Christine's mother, who was the serial killer, he had that information. Like he worked on the case, he wrote about it or whatever. Right. And that was a way for us to quickly get that information. Right. Did this, so in the book, if you remember, did she get a tea set or a present from her father with the Excelsior in it? That's right. Yeah. It was a giant box. Right. Yeah. I spent so long being confused about what Excelsior actually was. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just knew it was that stuff. I didn't know what that stuff was. It was just, that was it. Yeah. That, right. that, that. <laughs> Why are they saying Excelsior? Yeah. <laughs> I imagine like the stuff that you put in Easter baskets. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, he's going to need a lot of that if he's making a bed. <laughs> a little of hay. <laughs> yeah. It's just a bunch of. But do you remember the, the scene early on when Leroy just, he's so mad and he kicks at his bed? <laughs> oh. oh, it's such a great short little shot that you see his frustration. Yeah. And in the book, you learn all about Leroy's family and yeah. his wife and his kids. Oh, wow. And mm. it's, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, so it makes a nice counterpart. But so many lines that we see in the movie are directly taken right out of the book. Oh, mm. nice. Yeah. I like that when that happens. Right. So it's not like... It was loosely based on the book. It's like they just took the book, and I know there was a play that I only read part of, but you can really see a direct line mm-hmm. for all of these these lines in the movie and other things happening. So mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that it's an adaptation of an adaptation. You know what I mean? Right. Well, the play just made it easier, I think, to if you want to keep it in that format. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're ready to enter into our scarometer rankings. Ah. I think before we get there, can we talk about some of the awful taglines for this movie? Oh. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> the first one that, that made me laugh the most, and this is in all caps, a woman's shame out in the open. Oh my God. <laughs> that was the one they went with. Wow. Um, and then, Dislike. And then this one <laughs> says, talk all you want about the man and the woman, but- Please don't tell about the girl. What? <laughs> what is it? These are I I was dying reading these. This one is the year this one is this one would have been a better one to go with. The year's big shocker. Huh. Uh, and then this one's too long. A hidden shame out in the open and the most terrifying rock bottom a woman ever hit for love. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> for Dislike. love. Dislike. For love, no. yeah, exactly. Uh, and then this one, this one's good. I could see this being uh, if it was in the eighties. For little Rhoda, murder is child's play. Oh. <laughs> and then, uh, what would you do if you were cursed with the bad seed? Oh so, my! Yeah, um, I'd kill myself and kill it. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, well, not me, but Christine. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think those little taglines and movies that they put in trailers are so. That's hilarious. They can make or break something. Yeah. And like, I think with Alien, it was like, it's, it's, that's like the most perfect tagline for any movie ever. And then (laughs) for this one to be a woman's shame out in the open (laughs) is. It's not in the open. Uh, That's not not even true. Out in the open. (laughs) Also, I like how it's Christine's shame. That's right. Like, oh, her daughter actually just sucks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's like sometimes th- sometimes things go bad. Yep. Am I that surprised that that's like a 50s tagline? Of course. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's her fault. Oh, my goodness. I mean, suddenly all roads seem to lead to the bad seed. <laughs> and you could do so much research on what was happening in the 50s when this movie came out, what was happening in families, you know, with class, mm-hmm. what was happening in the, the world of... Uh, psychological thought and research, mm-hmm. so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that so either in the book or the movie they allude to the Korean War. Yeah, because Monica says she doesn't want to get turned into chalk. Yeah, Ugh. right, right. I was confused about that because um, one of my early notes is, uh, "Oh, Dad's leaving. Shit's about to go down." <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't figure out where he was going because, like, I know the book is fifty four. This movie came out in 56 the korean war is 50 to 53 so like he's not getting enlisted to go to war he's just going to some office or something right well people are doing things all the time even (laughs) if they're not actively in war right he's in dc doing something Uh, right 
Military yeah. business. Yeah. Well, I think we're just about ready to wrap up with our scarometer. What do we usually go on? Five stars? We, Ten? We five. did both last time. We did both last time. <laughs> 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 like I, think variety. We did, I think we did a five star for the scarometer and a ten star for the movie rating. Yeah, which is kind of funny. Yeah, great. We're I don't think group. any of it matters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Christopher, you lead us off. We'll do whatever I you do. Will. I might change it when he gets to me if I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to start with the the star rating of the movie. I give the movie nine out of ten stars. Uh, I think it's just fantastic and i didn't even realize it was a two-hour movie so the time goes so fast the acting is unbelievable mm -hmm. and so are the characters for horror i give it probably two and a half stars because i love how the horror is kind of everyday and common it's in your house in your family in your child mm -hmm. and the slow revelation and in the sudden punctuation of that when the mother realizes things is fantastic um i would say i will give it an eight out of ten i really enjoyed it um like and to echo what you said i it was a very fast two hours um even though it was it was it was all pretty predictable there were, it still kept me, it still kept me focused and paying attention the whole time. I really enjoyed it. The acting was just, was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. We had had a conversation ahead of time where you said that like, oh, the acting is just wonderful. And in my mind, I was expecting kind of the st standard fifties fair where it was just, this is going to be over the top and, um, and a lot of just men sliding women. And it was both of those things. But <laughs> yes. Christine owns the movie for me, 100%. Rhoda is perfect and terrible, and you hate her. And I also wanted to just strangle her every time I saw her. <laughs> but for me, um, anytime Christine wasn't on screen, which wasn't much, but the movie kind of suffered for me because she just was – she was great to watch. I didn't realize uh, until I was reading later that this was the this was the last motion picture that she was in. She only went into she only did TV after that. Nancy Kelly, yeah, yeah. which is interesting. But um, yeah, and then in terms of scares, I I would say one out of five, maybe. You know, but that uh, but that doesn't detract at all. It's like the I think the idea of having a child that kills is pretty scary. The execution in this, not maybe not necessarily so scary, but um, yeah, the idea is scarier than the movie is. I'm actually going to go with the same rating, 8 out of 10 in terms of like the quality of the movie and then 1 out of 5 for uh, the scarometer. Um, although I will say I love this movie. This like takes a bunch of boxes for me. Um, I love 50s and 60s stuff. Um the predictability of the plot was not a problem for me because that's just sort of the name of the game in this time period. Like, I'm not scared by Psycho or any William Castle. Some Twilight Zone things actually scare me, I guess. But it's more in concept than, like, actual. Like, they aren't scary episodes. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, and I was really happy to watch it. It was um, a movie that I had on my list that I wanted to see for a long time. So I was happy to have the opportunity to watch it with you guys. I struggle with the 10-point scale, but... <laughs> I'm just trying we'll to do some. Drill into that I was some trying point. to do some math in my head, and I'll begrudgingly <laughs> say eight out of ten, even though that sounds cr so bizarre to me. I guess eight out of ten. Um, I thought it was a really great film. I loved the acting. I love the simplicity of the shots. It's helpful knowing that it was based on a play, and that's why things are so static. But with that, the good thing about it being on, with the play is the dialogue is so on point. Every sentence is just so important, and it's so well crafted. The dialogue. For me, the scene stealers, I don't care about Rhoda whatsoever. Maybe the kid did a great job. Yay. I don't care about her. Um, for me, it was the two mothers watching Christine and Hortense in there. And it's not just like, a sa oh, a sad mother is wailing on the screen. It's not that. It gets even deeper than a typical like sad mother scene would do because you had the two of them and the scenes that they were in together were so intense and so breathtaking because they were feeling such 
intense pain for different reasons. One had, they were both essentially losing their children because one died but and one was the murderer. So they realize both of them have children that are gone and not what they thought they were and what they had. Um, so just the two mothers. For me, it was the two mothers, and it's about your, the seeds. It's about being a mother, being those two mothers and their pain and their grief. Um, so those two were the big steam sealers for me. I... Yeah, I don't know what I would change about it. I love, there's a couple of few, the really good scenes, some of the the good cinematography. There's only a, maybe three parts that I thought were really fun, um, but those stand out. But again, it's, you barely know it's a two hour movie. You really don't. It's just really visually, it's really well done. I thought it was really well done. Um, and I did not find it very scary at all. I guess one out of five for that. Uh, I don't think a movie has to have blood and guts to be scary, if this is uh, billed as horror or suspense, I think it's more on the suspense drama vibe. It is scary and it's horrifying to think of what an eight and a half year old child can do and what she can get away with and how manipulative and sociopathic she could be. Those are very horrifying things. But in the movie, I didn't find myself being very scary. I was thinking it more of like a a puzzler point of view where I was trying to like figure out, well, we know she did this, but how did she do it? And when is the mom going to find out? And is Leroy going to speak up? And what about Monica? It was more just asking those questions, but I didn't, I didn't think it was scary. It was just very visceral and strange. And yeah, I'm glad I, I probably wouldn't have watched this otherwise. I have a, not that I don't want to pick up an old black and white fifties movie, but I just have to be in the mood for that kind of a thing, you know? And I was just happy that someone's like, hey, watch this. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess I'm watching it. So thank you, Christopher, for bringing the bad seat to us. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I really didn't know much about it before. I can't believe I didn't mention Hortense Daigle in my... Same. What an idiot. Who what? am I? What's your, going on? She was like, she was like <laughs> the, best the best part of the movie. And I was just <laughs> like, I like the movie. <laughs> no, I don't know what. Was, yeah, she, and she's only in those couple scenes. But for me, it just set the tone and stole everything. Yeah. Was just the, the feelings and the, the raw, guttural emotion of, of that. And I do think that having her be intoxicated for some of her scenes, she was able to say things that a mother was trying to be polite to the other mother. You know what I mean? She was just just raw, raw and guttural and just like lying on the floor with her, her emotions and having her speak to the other mother. Anyways, I'm going to stop. I could just go on about the two mothers and their parallels and their sameness. Um, but again, both great. And so, yeah, Hortense gets a thousand out of a thousand. Yes. <laughs> Well, if you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thanks for joining us. This has been What Scares Us. What Scares Us.